Hello, everybody. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, Premier Shortcuts family, the best people in the place. Hello, if you can see me, if you can hear me, if you are ready to smart the cardiovascular system, let me see you type on. Yes! Jade Bourne, always Jade, number one in the house. Jade Bourne, see me, how are you? Yasa, Uze, Badria, Nadia, Ashia, Hassan, Gloria, Sue, Javin in the house. Yes, I'm here right now just to help you. Cardiovascular system. How many of you have a heart attack just hearing that word? Cardiovascular. This is going to be an amazing couple of sessions. Marwa, how you doing? Kimo, what are you saying? Gloria, fire! You know that. It's all about fire. I've been missed. You've been missed as well. Man like Marvin in the house. Gyal like Badria. Gyal like Badria. Maria, watch that. What can I say about Maria? What are you saying, Maria? Maria, Maria. <laughs> Ali, Alicia, Nicole, camera. Judy, hello, Judy. Anahita, I've never seen that name before. Anahita, give me a high five, Anahita. Great to see you hiding in the house. Good evening, everybody. Hope you're all ready for an amazing session. I am gassed. I am pumped. I'm excited. I've been counting down the time because I know that I've got so much for you today. Like if any of you, I promise you, you may have done some cardiovascular training at university. You may have attended some webinars, some lectures, but guess what? You have never attended Marvin's cardiovascular lecture. You know what I mean? It's a whole different experience. We're going to make it fun. We're going to make it exciting. And you're going to learn so much, so, so much. By the way, by the way, where is Theja? Theja Thomas, congratulations. Theja sent us an email. Theja has been smashing the card. Um, yes, the, the GI system, yes. Gastrointestinal chapter, chapter one. How many of you are feeling good right now? How many of you are feeling good to be here tonight? Give me a yes if you're feeling good to be here right now. 117 of you. I like that number, 117. Do you know I like 117? Because the Juxin is my favorite drug, and the Juxin in your BNF82 is on page 117. If you don't believe me, you can check it. You can check it. You can check it. Yes, I think it is. 117, the Juxin. That's what that's the page in your BNF. So, people, my video is on YouTube where blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes, yes. More being in the house. We're amazing for this topic. Trust me, if you enjoy the videos on YouTube, you've not seen anything yet. That was just a taster. That was just a taster. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's in here for you guys tonight. Just, just listen to this, right? So we're probably going to have about maybe about three sessions or four sessions on the cardiovascular system, four sessions, two hours per session, eight hours just on cardiovascular system alone, eight hours. Now, if you hear anybody saying to you, oh, my God, don't join that course. Oh, don't pay for a course. Oh, you know what? Don't do that. Don't listen to them. Because most of people are going to do a whole training day for eight hours until they're going to show you the cardiovascular system. They're going to teach you calculations. They're going to do MEP. They're going to do OTC. All in this name of a lovely training day. Next time when you hear that, just tell them, listen, Marvin spends eight hours just doing one chapter of the cardiovascular system. So can you not tell me you're going to teach me everything in eight hours? So people, welcome to the place to be. I've got energy. I'm gas. I'm excited. I turn up the heat for you. I turn it up because I'm so happy to see all of you. I'm here for you. Let's do this. How many of you are ready to do this tonight? If you're ready to have some fun tonight, just type in one, type one, type one, type one. Someone said today something happened at work. Can you type that again? The comments have gone up so quick. Someone said, what happened today at work? Someone said something that I just missed. Today at work, I had an argument about your cause. Don't worry about it. Let me tell you what. You guys, right? This is the problem. People get jealous of you because you are part of the family. And this is what I tell people. You wouldn't see this anywhere. We are not a cause. We are a family. We are a family. And and, and what I always say to people is, you know what? The best thing in life is experience, right? If someone says to you, right, blah, 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 tell them, fine, I'm going to come join your course. I'm going to see what you're about. 
I promise you 100%, you wouldn't see another course that gives you so much energy, that cares so much about you. No one talks about how many hours we spend, right? They say, I don't join that course, but they don't tell you how many hours this course is the longest course you're going to have. And we turn it up. That's what we do. That's what we do. So don't worry about arguments. If anyone's telling you anything because they're jealous, you are part of our family. And guess what? All of you in the family, you get a lot of benefits. You're always going to be with us. Even when your pharmacist was still going to be there, this journey doesn't end. And we have a big party coming up, which of course does big party for the family members. That is us. So don't worry about things, people. It's just jealousy. It's just jealousy. But we produce results. But the thing about us is we've got to stay positive. We've got to be happy. We know what we do for you. You know about the vibes. You experience it yourself. No one forced you to join this course. You came here yourself. So i tell you what, i tell you what I'm going to do for you guys today. Today, I'm going to give you, like I always do, the best training, the best information, and I cannot wait to meet all of you one-to-one. -one. Why? Because we are a family, right? We are not a course. And people find it hard to deal with that. We're not a course. We've gone far past that. We are a previous shortcuts family. We are in this together all the way till you pass the exam, right? So how many of you are ready? Give me a boom. Our boss went for tonight is a boom, people. Boom. Let's do this. This is the place to be. This is what we're going to be for the next two hours. And you're going to feel like it's just been five minutes. You're going to enjoy this. You're going to enjoy this. So let's go. The first slide right now. Cardiovascular system. If you can see the slide, give me one, give me one, give me one. So let me show you how cool this is. So on this course, right? calling of course but our family we are family someone is saying dark is it dark is it really dark oh wow why is it going dark that means i need to make it a bit smaller right so i guess this is all right this is all right i wish i could make it bigger but let's just stick to this because i don't want it to be dark anymore all right so um topics here's what i'm going to cover so um topics arrhythmias cardiovascular glycosides bleeding disorders venous thromboembolism stroke management anticoagulants antiplatelets d-a-o-a Right, that's what I'm saying, D-A-O-A, -A, but you know it's a do wax D-O-A-C, right? So direct acting oral anticoagulants, hyperlipidemia, lipid regulating drugs, statins, heart failure. We're going to cover all of this, and this is just lecture one, right? So when someone tells you anything next time, ask them, how many hours do you spend on cardiovascular system? If you want to say anything about the previous shortcuts, Ask them, how many hours do you spend on just the cardiovascular system? So this is just lecture one. Then we're going to go to lecture two. And lecture two, we're going to have angina, hypertension, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, diuretics, ACE inhibitors. Guys, you are in for a treat. <laughs> you are in for a treat. So that is a lot. It is a lot. But you know what? That's why you're on this course right? That's why you're part of this family, because we take the difficult things and we make them easy. Whitney, lot of kind of house. Whitney, how are you, Whitney? Whitney won one of those, um, one of the raffles to be here. So Whitney, how are you enjoying the course so far? Please let me know. Right. So we're going to cover all of this. We don't leave anything out. Hence the reason why many of you pass this course only with these notes. <laughs> so let's go straight in. The best place to be. Why is this important? I'm bet I bet that's gone dark again, so I'll, I'll make it smaller again. So why is this chapter important? Can you guys tell me why this is important? Can you tell me why it's absolutely important that you attend this session, that you learn everything on the cardiovascular? Because it is a high-weighting chapter. So that means that you're going to get up to 60 to 70% of questions from high rating chapters. So you will get loads of questions in your exam from the cardiovascular system. Hence the reason why we spend so much time, more time on the high rating chapters so that you don't miss anything at all. Oh gosh, I'm excited. I'm really excited. Has anyone checked Dijoxin? Because I'm coming to Dijoxin now. Is it page 117 in that BNF or not? Where's my BNF? BNF 82. Is it? Yes, you know the rest. So now therapeutic drugs, e.g. Dijoxin is a high-risk drug. So this chapter, the reason why it's so important, it has a lot of high-risk drugs, a lot of them. Right? You have anticoagulants, which are high risk. You have antihypertensives. You have parenteral drugs in here. You have so many drugs. Right? So you guys are in for a treat. Once you master this chapter, I promise you, you're in a very, very good place already for your exam because many, many questions will come from the cardiovascular system. 
So it's just like, I want to make it bigger, but at the same time, I don't want to make it bigger because when I make it bigger for some reason, you guys say the screen goes dark, which is not so cool because that never happens. So now this specific slide, it's not about Marvin. It's not about the combo course. This is from the GPHC itself, okay? This is from the GPHC. Remember I said to you, things in blue, watch out for the blues on the slides. The blues are from the GPHC. Either questions that have come up, or something with the GPC really wants you to know. So this slide right here, people, lovely people, the special ones, pre-read shortcuts. This is how we do, we are family. We are family. So um, everything in blue, this is not from me, this is not from Uma, this is not from pre-read shortcuts, this is from the GPC. So this is what the GPC wants you to learn. Be aware of the most recent guidelines. So nice guidelines throughout the whole sessions, we will go through all the guidelines all the updated guidelines, NICE guidelines, hypertension, HF, angina, stroke, all of this stuff. If you're looking at some of the things now, you're thinking, gosh, just, by the way, how many of you are scared of the cardiovascular? Like you think it's just overwhelming. It's just so much. You don't even know where to start. Type of me, type of me, type of me, type of me. All right. Uh, let me ask you something, right? On a scale of Hena Jamil, Hena Jamil joined the course today. Who's here for the first time? Who else is here for the first time? Type of one if you're here for the first time. Let me give you a shout. Welcome, Pritika. Hena, welcome. Great to have all of you. Nicole, Kiran, welcome. You have a lovely time. Muzdafa, you joined today. Great to have you on as well. So let me show you guys something. All of you that scared on a scale of one to 10, where are you? Assuming that 10 is the most scary, right? So on a scale of one to 10, where are you? In terms of the level of being scared. Right, so I'm getting loads of eights, I'm getting loads of seven, I'm getting loads of ten. The reason why I'm asking you this is because I want you to remember whatever number you put down now, because I'm going to ask you when we finish the chapter. I'm going to ask you how you feel with cardiovascular, and then I want you to tell me. Most of you are going to be like, wow, it's better right now, Marvin, I love it. So instruct patients, you need to um, be able to instruct patients on the safe. I got to love it because of you. Oh, lovely, Nicole. So instruct patients on the safe and effective use of their medications. So you need to know all those um, different advice that you give patients, how to use different medications, which we are going to cover throughout this um, next lectures, okay? Uh, medicines which um, with specific counseling points, there are many, okay? Your warfarins, your digoxins, all of those. Gregory says, listen to your YouTube videos in September. Yes, listen to those YouTube videos, but the course is even better. Ranges and interpretations, high risk, you need to know your ranges, loads of ranges, interpretations. You also need to know what to interpret them. So it's not enough just knowing that a range for, say, digoxin, for instance, is 1.5 to 3. You need to know what happens if you go above that range, okay? So you need to know what to do. A lot of um, questions as well are based on antidotes, things that you give to bring things back to normal. So we will cover all of this for you, recognizing um, your, when medicines should be taken, so say, for instance, your statins, exact, which ones you take at night, which ones you take at night, um, which, foods, which drugs have to be taken with food, without food. Recognize danger signs. So signs of bleeding, for instance, with your anticoagulants. And what do you do? Okay, look at vitamin K. When do you give vitamin K? What do you do if a patient is bleeding? What to do when situations? So when things happen, what do you do? The law of the sort of scenarios. Remember, this is not from Marvin. This is from the GPHC itself. This is from the GPHC. This is not just me talking. It's blue. Watch out for the boys in blue. So common side effects and drug interactions. Many of you always ask questions. Oh, do we need which drugs do we need to learn the side effects of? What interactions do we need to know? And I say to you, the all you're going to see them throughout the slide. Right? So, so it's very hard for anyone to tell, give you all the interactions you need to know from the BNF because it's just so many interactions. But um, you will have the key ones, the one you need to know, the key ones, the common ones, and you have those as we go through the slides. And there's a few of them definitely on the cardiovascular system. So uh, watch my YouTube videos if you haven't. I know many of you have watched YouTube videos already, but um, watch them if you haven't, just to boost your knowledge, just to get more understanding because some of these things that I, 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 I teach and out on YouTube, so extra knowledge for you. But the course is superior to all those YouTube videos. So how many of you are ready to roll? If you're ready to rock and roll, give me a two, 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 give me a two. Tedja 2, Kieran 2, Yasa 2, Judy 2, yes! Yeah.
And those of you that were on the course in October, remember the course has changed. So you guys will see a lot of new things. Even some of the mnemonics have changed. So it's all new to everyone. Right. Arifmia, let's begin. So what is an arrhythmia, people? What is, give me a definition. What is the definition of arrhythmia? What is it? What is it? What is an arrhythmia? Abnormal rate and rhythm. Abnormal rate and rhythm. Abnormal rate and rhythm. Right, loads of abnormal rates and rhythms. So if you don't know, put a zero. Safiya Ahmed, Falak, how are you? Ali Hamza. Zero from Shakira. Shakira, we've got celebrating the house. Shakira, Shakira. So, um, yes, so those of you that watch my videos, that's my memory trick. How many of you want a memory trick? Give me a yes, give me a yes, give me a yes. That's how I make this chapter easy. So the memory trick is looking straight into this. This is what I always explain. Arrhythmias has got two R's. The first R is for weight. And if you look at this, this is rhythm. So an arrhythmia is an abnormal A, rate and rhythm. Boom. There you go. Easy peasy. That's what an arrhythmia is. So many people get confused with arrhythmias, the struggle, but in this session today, I'm gonna smash arrhythmias for you. I will literally get you to be the boss when it comes to arrhythmias. So an arrhythmia is an abnormal rate of rhythm. That's the first thing you need to learn. But the main thing about arrhythmias is arrhythmias are formed from, just think about electrical conduction, right? Think about your brain and your heart. Think about your heart has got all this, so your heart has got all these electrical impulses that are responsible, depolarization, and I don't wanna go into detail, but the electrical impulses are responsible for the contraction of the heart. So when you have an arrhythmia, the flow of your electrical impulses is affected. So the heart will either beat too fast or it might beat too slow, or it's just going to have an irregular rhythm. Okay. So memory trick for arrhythmia is what I just showed you. And you detect arrhythmias using ECGs. So like I always tell you the best thing to do before, what, what did I say to you before you learn a topic? What do you do? What do you do with that topic first before you dive? Overview! You are amazing. If you put summary and you put overview, you are on it. Uh, how many of you actually find that helpful? How many of you think, wow, that is actually a good way of learning? A hundred percent. That's what I've been using all these years. It is fantastic. So it's a very good way. It gives you an overview and then boom, you smash it. Right? So let's do this. So here's an overview for you. I posted that out today. Some of you might have seen on social media, some of you in the group, you would have seen this. So overview, let me give you an overview. Let me try to make this bigger. Please let me know if it's still dark because that really disappoints me when it goes dark. Is it still dark? Yes or no? Dark. Oh, smoke. Okay. Let me just make that smaller. Can you guys still see it properly? Can you all, can you see, is it, all, is it clear? Can you see it? Great. Okay. Lucy says yes. If Lucy says yes, who am I to argue with Lucy? Yeah, like Lucy knows what she's talking about. So overview, very quick overview, and then we're going to go deep into it. So the first thing you want to think about is electricity. Think about electrical conduction, right? That's where arrhythmias, it's an obstruction to the flow of electrical current flowing in your heart. That's responsible for contraction. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one. So once this electrical conduction has been obstructed, and I'm going to tell you the things that could mess it up, we're going to look at that later on. So once the flow of electricity in your heart has been obstructed, it's not flowing in the right way, then you become, you get certain symptoms, some of them, palpitations, your heart starts beating irregularly, right? Palpitations, breathlessness, you start thinking, oh gosh, I'm getting out of breath because your, the blood isn't pumping as efficiently, so you're not getting enough oxygen, right? You start getting dizzy, not enough um, blood going to your brain, um, syncope, you might faint, chest discomfort, there might be a low chest tightness because again, that's sort of angina sort of pain, um, a stroke because if you don't get enough blood to your brain, then you get a stroke, right? So this is what happens. These are the symptoms. So if you went to see a doctor and you're having these symptoms, the doctor is then going to do an ECG. So generally, they try to look for those symptoms to be at least for a couple of days, all right? Not just like two seconds. It's not like all of a sudden, two minutes ago, I've got palpitation, doctor! No, I've got to give it some time, all right? Over a couple of days, all right? So they're going to do an ECG. They're going to check to see if you have an atrial fibrillation. Now, if you do have an atrial fibrillation, we are right there, people. Stay with me, stay with me. How many of you are still with me? Put a two, put a two, put a two. If you're still following this with me, stay with me. Don't lose me. So if they decide, fine. Um, Gregory, Hanan, you've got AF. So very important things for you to know. 
the first thing is everyone has got AF. That this is very important. There is a high risk when you have AF of getting a stroke. Because think about it. With AF, your blood isn't really, um, your heart isn't really pumping out enough blood, right? And so because of that, you have blood that is just collected. It's just sat in there in the chambers. And when you have blood that is just sat there and it's not moving around, then it's going to form a clot. And when it forms a clot, that clot, if that clot goes to your brain, that's a stroke. All right. So anyone that has atrial fibrillation has a high risk of getting a stroke. So they're going to assess your risk of you getting a stroke. So what is the risk of Hanan getting a stroke if she's got AF? They do that using something called a chat vas. So all of this we're going to look into detail later on. They do that using something called the chat vas score. If the chat vas score shows that Hanan and Leila Sayedi and Anne Rainbow or have a high risk of getting a stroke, it's gonna show that they are ladies, so they're gonna have a score that is two and above, right? So if it shows that they have a high score, then that means that they have a high risk of getting a stroke, which means we need to give them an anticoagulant, something that is gonna break down the clot, all right? So that anticoagulant is right here, well, break down the clot partially, all right? It's gonna stop coagulation. So um, this anticoagulant, you're gonna, which one do you give? You give the DOAX, which are literally things like dabigatran. I've got Reed, which we're gonna look at that later on, Rivaroxaban, Epixaban, um, Dabigatran, Edoxaban, okay? So these are all what we call DOAX, they're the first anticoagulants you give. If those are not working or not effective, then you could give them um, warfarin, all right? You also have to assess the risk of bleeding, right? So not just because if you give them anticoagulants, Anticoagulants can do what to you people? What's the main side effect with anticoagulants? What is it? Bleeding. So you don't want them to bleed as well. So you need to make sure that you balance things out between giving them an anticoagulant and also making sure they don't bleed. So you have to also find out the risk of this patient bleeding. Say for instance, if they had some sort of blood disorder, then they have a higher risk of bleeding. So in that case, you do what we call the orbit. It used to be has bled, but we're gonna look at that later and that's gonna give you the patient's risk of bleeding. And then you could decide whether to give them an anticoagulant or whether to reduce it or the dose or whether they have any risk of bleeding. Is this clear to now? Give me a two, give me a two. If that's clear, that's simple, Marvin, I'm standing stuff. So that's one part, let's put that to the side. Let's not make things complicated. I'm really trying to make things easy for you because if you read arrhythmia by yourself, it could be a bit too much. It could be a bit too much, all right? So I'm gonna explain this in detail. This is just an overview. So. Um, once you have AF, in terms of the treatment, we could treat AF in two ways. We can either control the rate, which is rate control, right? We can either control the rate, and this is just mainly tablets, medications, drugs, right? So we have dive better that we're going to look at later on. Those of you in the previous course, you probably had just dive better. I put a D there because that's for digoxin. So diltiazem, vivapamil, digoxin, beta blockers, that's what you use. Okay, so this is what you use. Rate control is normally the preferred sort of um, treatment, right? Rate control. So this controls the ventricular rate of the heart. Or alternatively, you can treat it through rhythm control. And rhythm control has two. You could either have drugs, which is pharmacological rhythm control, or you can have electrical rhythm control where you use things like cardioversion, which is a shock to the heart, okay? So rhythm has electricity or pharmacology, why rate is just pharmacology. Does that make sense? Give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one. I'm breaking things down for you before we go deep. And you need to know what drugs you use for rhythm control. So the pharmacological drugs are things like your fleconide, amiodarone, beta blockers, um, sotalol right down there somewhere. So, um, and then I've got PD, which I'm going to show you guys later on, because in the previous course, I hardly went that far. We just stopped on fab rhythm. So um, you could treat that, or you could use electrical um, shock which is cardioversion. So another part here, which we're gonna see later on, is that once you have atrial fibrillation, we have something called acute presentation. And so an acute presentation is, say you just had it now, new onset. It's just the first time, right? And you, and you go to hospital, for instance. If it's the first time you're having that acute AF, that's what it's called, acute AF. The first time you have um, atrial fibrillation, you could either have it very serious, where it's life-threatening, right? So that's acute AF could be either life-threatening or it could be all right, not life-threatening. So if it's life-threatening, so as a really what we call hemodynamic instability, that means that your blood is not flowing properly and you have a risk of getting probably a stroke or a heart attack and all of this. If the blood, um, if it's, if you've got any life-threatening symptoms when you have this AF, then you have to have electric 
elect emergency electrical cardioversion. In other words, electrical shock. Okay, but if you've had it for the first time, it's a new onset. It's a new onset. Um, it's a new onset atrial fibrillation, but it's not life threatening. Right, the blood is okay. Your blood pressure is not like zero. Then you can either use rate control or rhythm control tablets. Okay. So this is just an overview. And then down here, we're going to look at what cardioversion is. Someone put a question. Who was that put a question on the group today? Was asking, is cardioversion the same thing as rhythm control? And I said, don't even worry about it. That's why you've got Barbie on the combo calls. I'll say yeah for you. Who was that in the Telegram group? So I'm going to explain all of that today. Nims. Yes, it was Nims. Nims, what you say, Nims? This is your day, Nims. Today is your special day. So this is cardioversion. So just to clarify this. We're going to look at that later on. Yes, cardioversion is a type, it's what we call a rhythm control strategy. So rhythm control could either be electrical, so something like cardioversion is an electrical rhythm control, or it could be pharmacological, which is using drugs like flecainide, like amiodarones, like some beta blockers. All right, names? So cardioversion is a type of rhythm control. Okay, so that's an overview. Is this overview all right? Give me a three, give me a three, give me a three. You're like, wow, okay, Marvin, that sounds simplified, brilliant. So let's go deep, let's go deep. Key things I want you to learn, key terms, first of all, what is a normal heart rate? A normal heart rate is between 60 to 100. In order to understand arrhythmias, you need to know what we're talking about. A normal heart rate, heart rate should be between 60 to 100. If it's a more than 100 beats per minute, that's what we call tachycardia, taki taki. Taki Taki Roomba, you guys know that song, right? That's like Taki Taki, makes your heart jump, right? So that's Taki Cardia, makes your heart jump. So if your um, beats per minute is above 100, you call it Taki Cardia. If it's below 60, it's called Bradycardia, right? So we also have terms, I want you to get familiar with these terms. There is another arrhythmia called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And all that term means is it comes and goes. So some people have AF that is permanent and stable, while others have some AF that could come and go. So it might just last a few days or even just a few hours, and then it's gonna go away, right? This is what we call paroxysmal AF. It's not permanent AF, it's the opposite to permanent AF. Then we have something called pill in pocket, which is very easy to learn because it's literally what it is, a pill in your pocket. So again, this is for parismal AF, so people, that don't have regular atrial fibrillations. When I talk about regular atrial fibrillations, let me, let me make words easy for you. Look, we'll talk about heart palpitations, right? Your irregular heartbeats. So for people that, um, there are certain people that don't have permanent irregular heartbeats. It just happens sometimes due to certain triggers. So for instance, perhaps you guys have had this, right? Sometimes you have the situation where your heart just beats very fast. And certain things could trigger that, maybe some caffeine, some alcohol. So there are some people, if you have a paroxysmal AF, so one that is stress correct, Mara, one that is not permanent, then you can have something called pill in pocket where you only take medications when you have those symptoms. Does that make sense? So that's what I call pill in pocket. You're going to use the same medications, but you don't take them every day. You only take them when the symptoms come on. So th those pills are in your pocket ready for when you need them. Like B, but yes, so you could have like beta blockers, still the same drugs that you use for your AF. You could have those as well, just in your pocket when you need them. Then you have um, a term that you got to get familiar with is new onset AF. So new onset could be dangerous. So new onset could be life threatening. So new onset is like the first time, right? It's a new time you're having atrial fibrillation. So is this all clear? Give me a three, 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 give me a three. Me a three. Great stuff, making difficult stuff easy for you so what are the symptoms of arrhythmias give me some of the symptoms getting loads of symptoms yes yeah, someone's asking pill in pockets will it be red controls yes yeah, so mainly red control drugs mainly red control does your beta blockers mainly you can have some vera pamil in there and some diltiazem as well but loads of beta blockers um, palpitation, shortness of breath great great all of those are correct sad palpitation someone has been on the combo course Part of October, Lucy Craven, Falak, Kishan, great. So all correct. So we need to know our symptoms that come up in your exam, right? So someone's asking what's the third kind of arrhythmia again. We're gonna look at the different type of arrhythmias. Don't worry about it. And I'm gonna show you which ones you need to focus on. 
see me i'll show you which ones you need to focus you don't need to learn all of them so symptoms palpitations these are the symptoms you guys have written so please learn your palpitations and the memory trick is down there by nicoletta akk nicoletta Definite memory trick for you is sad palpitations because it's the sad thing to have palpitations and it scares you when you have palpitations. It's sad. It's sad. So sad palpitations, S for shortness of breath, A for abnormally fast, slow or irregular pulse, D for dizziness or feeling faint, P for palpitations, sad palpitations. Please learn your symptoms for arrhythmias. Okay. So what are the causes of arrhythmias? You need to know what's causing it. We've mentioned some already in our overview. What do you guys think are the causes? What's going to cause your heart to go up and down, beat irregularly? What's going to give you those heartbeats? Those, apart from that hot lady or that, that fit guy that gives you an arrhythmia, what else will give you an arrhythmia? Pre-reg exam, yeah, exactly. Exercise, drug-induced, wow. All of this stuff, why not? Sympathomimetics, correct. So drugs could really do that. So um, aging, correct. Aging is a big one, big one. Genetics, hypertension, all of this. So um, many complications of the heart. So many heart conditions like heart valves, yes. So um, heart complications especially are the biggest. They're like the number one cause, the number one cause of arrhythmias. So card coronary heart disease, things angina, any sort of muscle problem with your heart, cardiomyopathy, all of these on the heart will affect how well your heart pumps blood. And so that could lead to an arrhythmia. Hyperkalemia, yeah, I'll say more of hypokalemia, right? But yes, all of those because part of depolarization, potassium especially, your um, potassium electrolytes affects um, the flow of electricity, the conduction of that electrical current. So potassium definitely, um, control of potassium is important to prevent you getting an arrhythmia. But mainly hypokalemia will um, predispose you to um, getting an arrhythmia. Okay, aging, definitely. And then someone mentioned genetics. Yes, yeah, so if you have any sort of birth defects with an abnormal electrical pathways, then that could increase the risk of um, you having um, AF, right? So great, 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 that's all clear. Okay, so what are different types? Someone was asking what are different types of arrhythmias, which was the third one, right? So you have many different types because arrhythmias are sort of um, the name based on what part of the heart they are right, in terms of the location. So if it's around your ventricles, that's ventricular arrhythmia, the supraventricular arrhythmia. So you have different types of arrhythmias. You have atrial flutter, you have ectopic beats, you have many different types. You have um, tosade, the poentes. So there are different types, but um, you don't need to go deep into them because they don't really come out as much in the exam. The main one that you definitely 100% need to focus on is AF, atrial fibrillation. So here are your different arrhythmias, ectopic beats, AF, paroxysmal AF. So we've already defined what paroxysmal is. Um, atrial flutter, paroxysmal, supraventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, supraventricular arrhythmias. So let me advise you, I want to save you time. Don't waste your time trying to be so confused, learning all those different uh, arrhythmias. I'm going to show you what areas generally come up and what you really have to learn. All right. In the exam, you don't really get loads on the different ventricular tachycardias and things like that. But AF is the one right? Whatever happens, atrial fibrillation is the main one. So let's look into this. Mobin, yes, I'm here to help you, Mobin. I'm not here to waste your time. I really want to help you. That's why I sort of, I could, I could go to the BNF. I could give you a full lecture on all the different types of arrhythmias, deep explanations, pathophysiology, all of that, but that'd be a waste of your time. So I even have a video on YouTube. If you want to learn about the different arrhythmias, I've got a video on YouTube, arrhythmias, watch that video if you wanted to learn deeper into ventricular, supraventricular. But all you really need to know for your exam, the main one is AF. And I'm going to show you um, a few things that you need to know, other ones, okay? I am here for you. So um, let's go in, let's go in, boom, you know the rest. So let's look into AF because AF is the main one. Even if you didn't learn any of the other arrhythmias and you just learn AF, there's still a high chance you're going to pass because they're going to ask, they see a high chance, about 90% that the question that will come up will be on AF, not on ectopic bits or not on atrial flutter. So two aims of treatment. I mentioned this before. Anyone that's got AF blood is collecting, that blood isn't going out properly. So because of that, guess what happens? You have a high risk of getting a blood clot. Moss says, I think you missed a slide. Are you serious, Moss? I did, didn't I? Oh, yes, I did. Mars is on it. 
<laughs> I missed the slide. I was getting too excited, getting ahead of myself. So I didn't miss the slide. So treatments, okay? So this was just about the treatment of arrhythmias. So each arrhythmia based on the location has a specific treatment option. So um, you need to obviously treat the underlying cause. Thank you, Mars. Boom, giving you a fist back. So um, treat the underlying cause. So for instance, we've mentioned things like hypertension, coronary heart disease could um, cause arrhythmia even some thyroid issues. But um, so rather than just deal with arrhythmia, you can deal with the source as well. So if hypertension is like trigger, then try to treat hypertension as well. So um, we mentioned in treatments, you have medications, pharmacological treatment. Then we have electrical treatments, such as cardioversion. But remember, um, you have cardioversion um, electrical and you have cardioversion pharmacological tablets. And cardioversion all fall under rhythm control because they're all there to maintain that sinus rhythm or restore, restore sinus rhythm. So artificial pacemakers, so you could have that. Some people have, so these are devices as well that could be implanted. These are surgery procedures, implantable cardioverter defibrillators. So these are all sort of treatment options. But for your exam, the main one you need to look at is obviously the medication and then cardioversion. Okay, medication and cardioversion are the main ones I need to learn. They wouldn't really ask you questions on ICDs or artificial pacemakers. So atrial fibrillation, aim of treatment is to reduce symptoms. All those symptoms that we mentioned about, all those sad palpitations, our aim is to make sure that you will reduce the symptoms, shortness of breath and all of those. And then also to prevent any risk of you getting a stroke. We don't want you to have a stroke. So how do we prevent you from getting a stroke? We have to assess you. We have to check your risk of getting a stroke, right? So get, you, we don't want you to get a stroke. We don't want you to get a DVT, all right? PE or DVT, so thromboembolism. We also have to make sure that you don't also have a risk of bleeding because if we decide that we're gonna give you an anticoagulant to prevent you from having a stroke, we don't also want you to then have a serious bleed. So we need to do things in balance. Is this all clear? Give me a three, give me a three, give me a three, give me a three. If you understand that stuff, give me a three. So I'm breaking down complex stuff for you. I'm saving a lot of time. How many of you try to read arrhythmias and you've been very confused? Give me a one. How many of you try like open a BNF and you're like, gosh, what is going on here? So if you've not read this, then you wouldn't really see how much I'm facilitating this for you. But if you read this, you will see how much, okay? The types had my head spin. Don't let the types of arrhythmia have your head spin. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste because they don't really give you so many questions on the different types. They don't really give you those questions. AF is the main one. As long as you get your head around AF, you are in a good place. All right, in a good place. So AF, okay, I spoke about acute presentation. New onset, get familiar with these terms, right? So you don't get confused. So a new onset arrhythmia could be very dangerous, okay? It could be life-threatening or it could be all right. It could be fine, all right? So let's look at acute presentation. So someone has come to the, um, for the first time, they're having these palpitations or this severe um, shortness of breath. So if you're having those acute palpitations or presentation, the question is, is it life-threatening? If it's life-threatening, what we call life-threatening hemodynamic instability, it simply means hemo is blood and dynamic is movement. It simply means you have an abnormal blood flow. And if your blood isn't flowing properly, guess what? You have a high risk of then getting um, a heart attack, getting a stroke, getting high um, blood pressure could drop. So there's many things that can happen if your blood isn't flowing properly. All right. So that's what we call hemodynamic instability. It could cause a lot of um, issues, right? Because your blood isn't flowing properly, shortness of breath and all of that. So if the patient's got life um, threatening um, acute presentation, either give you an exam, for instance, then you have to undergo emergency electrical cardioversion. In other words, em em electrical shock. Right. So because it is an emergency, you don't even try to think about tablets and things like that. It has to be electrical cardioversion. Is that clear? If that's clear, give me a three, give me a three, give me a three, give me a three, give me a three. Great stuff. So the next question is, what if the person presented themselves? Right. And also the timing is important. Is it less than 48 hours? Is it more than 48 hours? So if the person presented themselves with AF, but there wasn't any life threatening symptoms. So perhaps they didn't have any shortness of breath and things like that. It was just maybe some palpitations. Right. So in patients presenting acutely, but without life threatening symptoms, then you have a choice of giving them rate or rhythm control. OK, so it could be either rate or it could be rhythm. 
right? The top one, if it's life-threatening, it is electricity. It shock them, right? But if it's not life-threatening, you could give them rate control or you could give them rhythm control. Edson, Edson says, what do you do with life-threatening that's not new onset? So generally, yes. So even if um, new onset is normally, they normally do that with electricity. And I'm going to explain that to you later on. So if, um, so if you had one that wasn't um, life-threatening, then you're most likely still going to do um, some sort of cardio version, right? You still do some rhythm, but um, you will have to give them some anticoagulation in, in, in advance. Or you could still do um, as if it was life threatening, okay? But it wasn't. So anything that's life threatening, you are more likely going to give them rhythm control, okay? Rhythm control. But um, if it's not life threatening, then that's when you could give tablets, give rate or rhythm, okay? So Ahmed, how do we know if it's rate or rhythm? Is there a specific sign and symptoms for rate or rhythm? So not really, no, you wouldn't, um, rate or rhythm is just more of the treatment because you know about the signs, whether um, the arrhythmia is life-threatening, you know from the signs of that patient, whether it looks like an emergency, then you go for rhythm. But um, generally what's advice is if um, it's not life-threatening, then they generally recommend rate control, right? So rate control, which we're gonna look at later on, rate control are just tablets, okay? Weight controller tablets. So we're going to explain that to you later on. So if it's not life-threatening, in patients presenting acutely, so they have no um, life-threatening symptoms, you have the choice. So you could either give them weight control or you can give them rhythm control, right? And this could be cardio version rhythm, or this could be um, tablets, pharmacological rhythm. But here you have more choice, okay? But the preferred one is weight control, and we're going to look at later on what weight control is. So get yourself familiarized with this. Non-life-threatening doesn't mean you just have to have one. You've got choice of either rate or rhythm, but it's advisable to go for um, rate control, especially if it's more than 48 hours. Is this like clear? Give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one. Great stuff, because this is where people get confused. So if you're understanding this stuff, I am doing a good job, a good service to you. So next one, um, anticoagulation blue. Can you guys see blue? Give me a two if you can see blue. That means this is important. So Marvin Munzu is going to slow it down, right? So um, this has come up in an exam question. So we're looking at anticoagulations with AF, right? Atrial fibrillation, which we're gonna discuss later on. So you know I mentioned about, um, you have to test the patient's risk of stroke. And if the person has a risk of stroke, then you give them an anticoagulant. So um, parenteral anticoagulation, this is like heparin should be offered to patients with new onset AF who are receiving no anticoagulation until assessment is made and appropriate anticoagulation is started. So um, this is quite straightforward in the sense that if um, you had new onset um, atrial fibrillation, before they even decide, for instance, um, we're gonna give you um, some rivaroxaban and things like that, because it is that urgent and they wanna prevent you from having a stroke, you're gonna have an injection, right? It makes sense because heparin is an injection. So right, you need something that's going to act fast because you don't really know what the situation is. So you give them heparin and then while you do your assessment and everything, then you could gradually then give them oral anticoagulation. And the oral anticoagulation that you're going to give, normally the DOACs are first, okay? The DOACs are first. We're going to look at DOACs later on. Are recommended as first line. If they cannot take a DOAC for any reason, perhaps a renal impairment, that's when warfarin comes in. So you don't just go oral, you give them warfarin, it has to be DOAC. Is heparin given alongside rate or rhythm control? Yeah, so heparin will normally be given um, first and then alongside, then you could have rhythm, right? So even rhythm control, things like cardioversion, before you do cardioversion, we're gonna look at that later on, you want to give them anticoagulation because cardioversion itself can cause a stroke. But we're going to look at that later on. So yes, so alongside, yes. So you give heparin and you can give that with weight con rhythm control or even weight control. Okay, is this for both life-threatening and non-life-threatening? Yes. All right, yes. Is this LMW or heparin infusion? So this is normally, um, LMW, we'll look at heparins. So heparins are unfractionated, okay? Unfractionated, standardized. That's the infusion you want to use because you can stop it quicker than LMWH. But we're going to explain that later on. I keep, we'll have that even more detail. Evangeline, if the child VAS score is high and so is the orbit, will you still give or... Okay, we'll come to that later on. We'll come to chat vast and orbit, and then we can answer that question. I don't want to go too far when we've not got there yet. So great stuff. All our anticoagulants are offered 
to patients that are confirmed AF. So if it's confirmed that you have AF, you will get um, some oral anticoagulation. Did you say you give rate plus HEP? So heparin, you give heparin even before the rates, right? So before you give rate or rhythm, this is like the initial. So if someone already has, um, has a new onset of AF, the first thing you want to do is you want to prevent them having a stroke. So before you go even into the treatment of giving them either the rate control, your beta blockers, or you get into rhythm, but mainly rhythm. I'll say mainly rhythm than rate, mainly rhythm, because rhythm is the one that things like cardioversion could cause, um, a, was cause a clot, right? So heparin, go, rhythm, right? Rhythm, so before you even get into, okay, I'm gonna give them rhythm control, I'm gonna give them rate control, you want to make sure that they have some sort of anticoagulation, right? So heparins. Is that clear? Give me a two if that's clear. So it's not as much like, oh, do you give this and that? It's more like a prevention thing. Start off with some heparins so there's no risk. Then we could go into our rate control. Then we can give them the rhythm control. Great stuff. So um, this slide here, this slide here, um, someone's asking how long before cardioversion do you have to give um, this? So it's normally three weeks, but I'm going, I'm going to cover that later. I will cover that later. It's normally three weeks, at least three weeks before. So antiarrhythmic drugs is good. Um, so you know what I said to you guys, you don't really have to go deep into learning supraventricular arrhythmias and things. The main part that you need to learn is rather than learning what each one is, is just knowing um, some of the classifications, the drugs that are used. All right, so verapamil, adenosine, cardioglycosides for supraventricular. So just this slide. I'll see if you want to learn anything, just learn which medications are used that could come up, that could come up. Very rare, but any of those could come up, which drugs you use for ventricular arrhythmias, like an extended matching question sort of thing. So then do we give an oral anticoagulant alongside the heparin? You will give, yes, you will give. So you start with the heparin and then later on, you will sort of then um, switch them to an oral anticoagulant. So heparin is normally given just for a short term at the beginning, initially, to just prevent that clot because the injections, and then whilst the start, the cardioversion, you then switch the heparin to um, oral anticoagulants, okay? Because you don't also want to give both together at the same time, you got, because you don't also want to increase that risk of bleeding. So it's heparin, and then you then gradually switch to oral. So Vaughan williams classification. So this is a way of classifying arrhythmias. So again, this is just memorization, right? This is just memorization in terms of classification. I've tried to make that simple. Just learn these ones, examples for ventricular arrhythmias, learn the drugs that are used, examples for supraventricular arrhythmias, and then the classification. They don't give, they don't really ask questions on this in the exam. You might see one or two marks, but in the exam itself, but it's just worth learning. So class one, class two, class three, class four. What I'm gonna point out for you is that this drug here is a very naughty child. Sotalol is the one child that is just not part of that family. You know, you know, you have that brother or sister or that cousin, you're like, gosh, I can't even believe that's my cousin or my brother because we're just so different because he or she is so weird compared to me. That's Sotalol. It's just the weird bitter block kind of family. Like no one likes Sotalol, right? So, so Sotalol, it's a class two because beta blockers is class two, but it's also class three just to confuse you. That's Sotalol for you. So Sotalol is here and there, okay? What kind of question can they give? Perhaps they can just give you a question which of this is class two. My right, class two um, classification, Vaughan Williams classification, which drug is a class two um, classification, anti arrhythmic drug. So, in that case, beta blockers. So, just worth learning, and then your calcium channel blockers come under here, class four. So, simple, but just memorizing. So, once you learn that, that's fine. So, let's go into this. You guys have been asking some questions that I've answered most of them, but there's some that your answers will come up now. So, let's look at that again. So, now we're looking at drug treatment. Rate control is mainly drug treatment. Don't get confused. Rhythm control, you have drugs and also electricity, right? So, rate control is the preferred. This was an exam question. Maybe I should put this in blue. Watch out for this. This came up in the exam. So the questions will be more direct. They'll be more direct. So don't panic if you're like, gosh, my God, what's going on? The GPC makes it a lot easier for you. All right, this should be in blue. Let me put that in blue. So let's look at this rate control. Rate control. Is Sotalol class two? Yes, it is class two and class three. So that's what I was explaining there. Sotalol is class two and class three. It's weird like that. because It's class two because class two are beta blockers and it's also class three. 
So um, let's look at rate control. So what is rate control? We're looking mainly at tablets for this one. So it is a preferred first line treatment strategy. So rate control is normally the one that will be recommended that most patients will be on for AF, right? So it's mainly rate control compared to cardioversion and flecainide and amiodarone. You will see that they're mainly rate control drugs. So you need to know for your exam, this has come up in the exam, which drugs are used in rate control. So hopefully it'll be that simple where you just have to know the drugs that are used for rate control. So what drugs are used for rate control? What drugs? I have I had dive better for some of you, dive better. So you need to know the drugs, put the drugs down. And then another important thing you need to learn is rate control is obviously the preferred treatment strategy, but there are certain um, factors that could um, make rate control not be the first line and you will go for rhythm instead. Right, so important that you learn that rate control is the preferred first line unless you have these conditions. If you have these conditions, then um, rhythm control is the preferred first line. All right, so we're looking at new onset AF that we mentioned. So new onset AF, um, you probably go more. That's when you go for rhythm control. Atrial flutter for an ablation strategy. Ablation is just another um, procedure that gets um, currents, heat energy, cold energy into your heart just to get it working properly. So atrial flutter, um, ablation strategy, AF, if it's got a reversible cause, so if it's caused by, for example, an MI, is MI has caused the AF, hypo, hypothyroidism, things that you can reverse. Maybe it's just a bit of caffeine, alcohol. These ones, heart failure primarily caused by AF or if rhythm control is more suitable. So these are the exemptions. These are the situations where you're not going to use rate control as first line. But apart from that, rate control is normally the preferred first line. Does that make sense? Give me one, give me one, give me one. D2 better. Yes, that was a mnemonic I used to use from the previous class. Yes, 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 yes. So that has changed now. Great, I'm getting lots of ones. So know your drugs of rate control. You guys are all correct. Rate control, you have beta blockers, but not the naughty one. So Rachel Melman is asking, what are the drugs of rate control? Which was the GPT question? Blue, blue. So learn the drugs beta blockers, but not sotalol. Rate limiting calcium channel blockers, diltiazem, verapamil, digoxin. So digoxin is normally used for um, non paroxysmal AF. Digoxin is normally used a lot in heart failure, patients that perhaps have atrial fibrillation and heart failure, or patients that are sedentary, they don't move, right? If you're like just chilling, lying down on your couch, not doing any exercise, they call sedentary patients. These are the patients that um, will benefit from digoxin. All right, so digoxin is not really used as one of the first lines. Your first lines are normally um, your beta blockers, and then you could give some diltiazem, or you can give verapamil, and then digoxin is at the bottom there. But digoxin, you need to know when digoxin is used, so mainly for sedentary patients, people that are not active, and also um, patients that have got um, heart failure. That's where digoxin comes in. So um, mnemonics, that's a mnemonic, very clear slide, fantastic. How many of you find the slide clear? Give me one, give me one. I'm trying my best to so make this clear for you. You wouldn't see this anyway. So mnemonic, diveta or D2, D2 for diltiazem and digoxin, verapamil, beta blockers. Great. So you use one, okay? So it's not all of them. You use just one of them, all right? One at a time. It's called monotherapy. That's why I have here monotherapy's advice. So it's advice for weight control that use one at a time. Now, if you use one and that's not working, then you can use two, but you need to know which two to use. So the next slide. So remember, no sort of law in rate control. Sometimes the GPH is gonna ask you that. So just remember that so you don't fall in that trap. You can use beta blockers, but no sort of law in rate control. Sort of law is more rhythm control, right? So um, can the digoxin be used as monotherapy? Yes, but most of the time, not really, but it can be used as monotherapy. So um, if monotherapy fails, so monotherapy, you use one drug and it's not really controlling the um, atrial fibrillation, then you could use two drugs. So the two drugs you could use, I've got BBDD, BB just means beta blockers because it's double and we have two Ds double, so it just helps you remember which ones. So you could use your two Ds or you could use the Bs, right? So you could use beta blockers, digoxin, diltiazem. So no verapamil here. This is the combination. So you could use two of these if, Previously, one isn't working. If one isn't working, then you can use two. 
And if you use two and the symptoms are still not controlled, then you move on to rhythm control. Does that make sense? So this is weight control, which is on the first line, unless we have exemptions that we mentioned here. If you go for weight control, then it has to control the heart rate. If you use one drug and it's not controlling the heart rate, you can then use two drugs. If these two drugs are not controlling the heart rate, then you move on to rhythm control. Does that make sense? Give me one, give me one. If that's clear, give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one. Great stuff, great stuff, great stuff. So good stuff. I'm trying to break this down for you, making it easy. So let's go now into rhythm control. Rhythm control is a big one, right? So weight control is a bit easy because you just have those drugs and that's it. Weight control, you have pharmacological and then you have electrical. So drugs, so we'll look at the pharmacological. So what drugs do you use? You need to know which drugs you use for rhythm control. What drugs do you use? Previous in the course, we had fabulous rhythm, Bob Marley. If you guys have noticed, some of you have taken away pictures and things because I don't know, you know, Zoom gave us a, a hard time. So perhaps some of it was like, oh, you had music and things like that. So I've taken away some of these things um, just not to get in trouble with Zoom. <laughs> right? And those things are fun because they're making it like look good. So drugs for rhythm control, post cardio version. So please learn your drugs for rhythm control. Um, beta blocker, right? but not so to law. Now I'm saying this, don't get confused here. Sotolol, you can use it, but not as first line. So when you see not Sotolol, you're going to see Sotolol down here. You're going to go, oh my God, Marvin. Oh, you said not Sotolol. And then you're saying Sotolol. What is going on, Marvin? No, so what here is you could use your first line is beta blockers. So beta blockers normally first line, but not Sotolol. So you cannot use Sotolol as a first line for rhythm control. It's right at the bottom. You use it like down there right the naughty child goes down to the bottom right the down there sat down the stairs did you say we have tablets and electrical shock for cardioversion yes yes so cardioversion are really control you have tablets and you have electrical shock which we're going to look into so now i'll look inside we'll have a separate slide for cardioversion i'm just answering ali samaka I got you, Ali, I have got you. I have you, Ali, I've got you covered. So um, the slide probably after this, we're gonna look into just cardio version in itself. Then you're gonna see, you're gonna see the answer to that question you're asking right now. So rhythm control, right? So rhythm control, just learn your drugs, beta blockers. Fabulous rhythm, we had that previously, FAB. Fleconide, amiodarone. I've added these ones in there. These are not the common ones, but the common ones are fab, fabulous rhythm, fleconide, amiodarone, and beta blockers. Then you have these three on here as well. PDS, right? So Sotolol, but not as first line. Propafenone and dronedarone. These are all drugs that are used for rhythm control. Isn't rhythm control cardioversion? We're going to explain that to you. It is. So Cardio version is what we call a rhythm control strategy, right? So yes, so you could say, yes, it is, it is rhythm control, but it's not solely. So I could say cardio version is a, is a strategy for rhythm control. So if you see rhythm control, it's like an umbrella th term for different things, but um, because you have cardio version is rhythm control. Ablation strategy is a rhythm control. Pharmacological rhythm control, like using fleconide and amiodarone. So I'm saying that because I don't want you to get confused. I know people get confused, but cardioversion is, yes, it is a rhythm control because cardioversion works on maintaining the sinus rhythm. So it's trying to get your rhythm back, right? But it's not solely, I don't want you to think like rhythm control is cardioversion and that's it, but try to understand that cardioversion is like part of rhythm control as opposed to just exactly the same thing. Does that make sense? M. Ash is like, as like a child, cardioversion is a child of rhythm control. So beta blockers are both weight control and rhythm control. Innocently, absolutely. Yes, I love you guys making those connections. Beta blockers are the first line for rate control and the first line for rhythm control. Makes life easy, doesn't it? Right, so beta blockers are first line for both. But not so too long. So um, there we go. Um, is this all clear? It's all clear? Give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one. Making sure because I'm understanding this stuff. Making sure you understand this stuff because no one's ever going to break this down for you like I'm doing right now. <laughs> Great stuff. So cardio version, you're asking me questions about cardio version. You said not. Okay, let's see. Layla Sayedi, Layla. What are you saying, Layla? You said not Sotolol for rhythm, and at the end you put Sotolol. Oh goodness, I just explained that. <laughs> I just explained that. I said someone is going to ask me this question. I just explained that. Okay, I'm going to go back just for Layla's sake. Just for Layla. what I said. What I said was 
Yes, I've got sota law there, not sota law. And here I've got sota law. But what I was saying is I'm saying sota law not as first line, right? Yes, you can use sota law because, because beta blockers are first line. So if I said to you, beta blockers are first line, you're gonna, if, they, if it came up in the exam, you think, all right, you could use sota law because it's a beta blocker as first line. But I've told you sota law is a naughty chart, right? So although we're talking about beta blockers first line, sota law is not used as first line. It's used when you've tried all other things and then you could come to sort of law. It's right at the bottom. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Layla, Layla, lovely name, Layla. Yes, yeah, sort of law is not pure <laughs> beta blocker. <laughs> That's it. It's mixed. It's an alien beta blocker. Beta blockers and all the other med mentioned drugs on this slide we would use after carrying out cardioversion. We'll use them after cardioversion. You could use them after cardioversion if you were using cardioversion, right? Because sometimes you don't need to use cardioversion. So you could use a beta blocker um, without having that, but most of them, yes, post cardioversion. Okay, so um, let's look at cardioversion. I think we'll get confused, cardioversion. So cardioversion, you've got two types. You've got two types, please learn that. It's not just electricity. You've got pharmacological cardioversion and you've got electrical cardioversion. So for patients with new onset AF who are treated with a rhythm control, remember we said in the previous slide that with new onset, you don't use rate control, you go for rhythm. So patients with new onset um, AF um, treated with rhythm control, um, this you could use cardioversion, right? You could use cardioversion. So cardioversion obviously works on the rhythm, it restores your rhythm. There are two types of cardioversion. You have electrical, which is just electrical shocks, and you also have the tablets. So these tablets, tablets here that we're looking at, like fleconide, like amiodarone, these are all, these are all pharmacological cardioversion, okay, the pharmacological cardioversion. So fleconide, amiodarone, um, also learn this, Amyl, um, fleconide is good, but if the patient's got any sort of ischemic heart disease, any structural problems with the heart, then you don't give them fleconide, you give them amiodarone instead, because amiodarone is fine with ischemic heart disease. Right. Can you go back a slide? That's the slide. Zainab, Zainab Al Sayed, Zainab, lovely name. You guys have got lovely names. I love saying it. it's just so lovely. Cardioversion is electrical for rhythm control. Did you mean that rhythm control is cardioversion? I'm confused. Aliyah, so one word cardioversion, and cardioversion has got two types. Cardioversion has got electrical cardioversion and it's got pharmacological cardioversion. Is that right? If I said cardioversion could either be tablets or it could be electricity, but they're all called cardioversion. So which one you're either going for electric cardioversion or pharmacological cardioversion? Ali, so we use electrical only when life threatening. Yes, yeah, so majority of the time. Um, I wouldn't say not only when life training, because there could be other conditions where you will have to use it. Okay, so perhaps as we mentioned before, a patient cannot have rates, then you use um, life, um, you use electrical. But if it is life threatening, absolutely, you're going to use um, electrical. So definitely, yes. If it is a life threatening, you will use emergency electrical cardioversion. All right. If it's life threatening, you will use electrical emergency cardioversion. But do you only use um, Cardioversion when it is life threatening, no. You could use cardioversion as normal, but if it's life threatening, it is definitely electrical cardioversion. How long is pharmacological cardioversion given for? I know you've said it many times, but can I just confirm for the last time that cardioversion is the same as rhythm control? Oh my goodness. You guys have to watch this video again and it's going to clarify your answers. Cardioversion is a type of rhythm control. Yes, it is a type of rhythm strategy. Right, so it is a type of rhythm control, yes. Uh, what's the electrical and pharmacological drugs? So electrical is just shock. So electrical are not drugs, it's like just an electrical shock. While the pharmacological drugs are these ones, the ones used for rhythm control. So these are the pharmacological drugs, your fleconites, your amiodarones, these are pharmacological rhythm, cardioversion rhythm control. Okay, great, 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 great. Loads of questions. Is it only monotherapy for rhythm control? So perhaps if like a fills, do you add? Most of the time it's um, monotherapy. Most of the time it's monotherapy, but you could have two drugs as well. 
But I don't think it states more about these ones with two drugs. It states more for the rates because that doesn't happen. Then you go to rhythm. But uh, most time rhythm, yes, it's going to be one drug. Or yes, you can use you can use both. But it's very dangerous for rhythm control as well. Rhythm control is a very dangerous um, part as well, especially with cardioversion. If new onset AF is hemodynamically stable, stable, even when you give rhythm control, don't understand that question. If new onset AF is stable, even then you give. So if it's stable, you could give either or, right? So if it is stable, you can give either or. Like you give rhythm, or you could give rate. Ideally, rates would be better if it's stable, right? But definitely, if it's unstable, you give rhythm. So you always have to understand that there is there is one that you have to definitely give rhythm, while the others that it could be either or. It doesn't have to be um rate or rhythm. You could choose either of those options based on the patient, based on different factors. Is rhythm control cardiac conversion plus? Okay, I think I'm going to just stop with those questions because we're not going to move forward. I think most of the questions are getting me to repeat myself. So I think some of you just have to watch again and it'll be clear. Cardioversion is a general term used to refer to this. Thank you very much. As is trying to help me out there. So please, I know you guys ask a lot of questions, but I will have to move with 187 of us. And I'm sure that probably over 100 of you have understood it. So if you're a bit stuck, that's fine. Just watch the video again, it's gonna make sense. Can you break down FAB mnemonic? What does that stand for? So FAB um, stands for this, um, stands for flecainide, which is this. A is for amiodarone, and B is for beta blockers, right? FAB rhythms, S is for sotalol, P is for propafenone, and D is for dronedarone. So that is what this means, okay? Great stuff. Trust me, it wouldn't get, this is probably gonna be hardest for most of you. After this, it's gonna be so easy. But it's very clear. So um, once you read this again, you're going to get your head around it. So this is what cardioversion is. So if AF is greater than, so we're only focusing here on electrical and pharmacological cardioversion. Focus on this. It's got nothing. This slide has got nothing to do with rate control. This is only in terms of cardioversion. So which one, when do you choose electrical? When do you choose pharmacological? So if the AF has been greater than 48 hours, so the patient's had this for say about five days, right? Electrical is preferred over pharmacological. But before you give electrical, you have to give them some sort of anticoagulation for at least three weeks. And the reason why you have to give them the anticoagulation is because cardioversion in itself, electrical cardioversion can lead to a stroke. Because what it does is when you give that electricity, it breaks up, um, it moves the clots around, right? So if you use um, electrical cardioversion and someone has AF and say they have some sort of clots, then when you use cardioversion, that cardioversion could move some particles around. And if those particles go to your brain, then that's a stroke. So it's a very dangerous process. So before you even do electrical cardioversion, you need to make sure that there isn't a risk of a clot going to a certain part of the brain. So you want to make sure that you dissolve that clot, any clots that are there, before you even do electrical cardioversion. That's why it says before you do cardioversion, you give them anticoagulation for about three weeks. At least three weeks, some of you are asking how long that answers the question. So delay it if you can. If you can, delay the um, card electrical cardioversion until you've given the patient enough anticoagulation so that there's no sort of clots around and there's no risk of stroke. Now, if you cannot delay it, so you cannot wait three weeks, that person needs the cardioversion now, then you have to give them heparin, right? So that's a quick acting anticoagulant. So you have to give them heparin immediately and then you can do um, cardioversion. So once you've done the cardioversion, and this was another question someone was asking, once you've done the uh, um, cardioversion, then you need to continue oral anticoagulation. So this time, perhaps you could give them some rivaroxaban, right? So you have to give them anticoagulation after the cardioversion for at least four weeks, all right? So the whole idea is around card electrical cardioversion, you need to have anticoagulation because this electrical, um, electrical cardioversion can actually spread around those clots that could lead to a stroke. So it's very important that anytime you see um, electrical cardioversion, if you're asking, has this person received any anticoagulation? It has to be three weeks before. If you don't have that time, then give them heparin. And then once you've done it, at least for four weeks, continue giving them an oral anticoagulant. Great. Does that make sense? Which oral coagulation to give? So it's normally your DOACs, right? So your rivaroxabans, your apixabans. 
But didn't we say new onset without life threatening? That's why I said, okay, let me go back. That's why Negis asked a question, but didn't we say new onset without life threatening is greater than rate 48, you should give rate control. That's why I said, we are only dealing with cardio version here. We are not talking about rate control on this slide. We're, we're talking about only, when you see this saying preferred, it's saying electrical is preferred over pharmacological cardio version. It's not saying this is preferred over rate control. Nothing to do with rates on this slide. It's just about electrical. It's saying, when do you give electrical and when do you give pharmacological, which is the tablet? Great, does that make sense? They're getting fantastic. That's why I said that. So that's quite normal for people to get confused about that. That's why I said that at the beginning of the slide, I said, this is only to do with cardio version. Don't even think about rates so that you understand that that's what this means, right? Great, is this all clear? People give me a three. Because if this is clear, then you are laughing. I promise you 100%. If you try to learn this by yourself, you'll be confused. You'll be all over the place. I have saved you decades of learning, decades in the slides. So when you go through the slides, it will make so much sense. It will make so much sense. So atrial fibrillation, that is the hardest part you're going to have with the whole of this session. After this, everything is easy. Right? Can you guys believe we've been here for over an hour? We've been here over an hour already. So. Over an hour, how many of you are having fun? How many of you are like, wow, this is complex, but it is making it easy. You're understanding if you did this by yourself, it is very difficult for most people to understand. It is very confusing. How many of you before this session tried to read this and you're confused and now you feel like, ah, I understand better now. Give me a one, give me a one, give me one, because it is confusing. I had to read this stuff several times myself to get my head around it because you talk about read them is read them. So I understand all those questions you're asking. Because I know the questions you asked before because it is confusing. But the way I've explained this and looking at these slides, you go through it, I've put everything out easy for you. So atrial fibrillation, how do you assess the risk of stroke and how do you assess the risk of bleeding? Some of you were asking about orbit. Some of you asked about chat bar. So very important comes up in your exam. So everything going forward will be easy now. We've done the hardest part. We've done the hardest part. Everything else will go smooth. I haven't even tried to read. I was waiting for you to simplify it. <laughs> yeah, that's it, isn't it? It's good to have that simplifying, um, someone to simplify, and then you go read it. Now, those of you that did not even read it, you're going to have it so easy because you're not going to feel that pain, right? You've cheated, basically. You're not going to feel the pain of trying to read it without the lecture notes. So now that you have the lecture notes, when you read it, it's just going to make sense, and you just go through it, and these explanations as well. So um, what do you use to assess? So we use Orbit. Um, and has bled, right? So um, Orbit is obviously the new one, is the most effective one, is better than has bled. Has bled is what we've always used. But um, so the GPS this time, I asked you a question on Orbit. They've not asked yet, but because it was only sort of new and um, Orbit hasn't even been incorporated into many um, pathways, okay? So there are many like hospitals or GP surgeries that still don't even have the Orbit system in the whole clinical system that they use, not yet. So it's sort of being incorporated gradually. So there are still many places that are still using Hasbled. So my advice to you will be to learn both, just in case the GPC asks you on Hasbled instead, right? I did read it, but now it makes more sense. Yes, Leila, brilliant, brilliant, makes more sense. That's why I'm here. That's why I do this with you, to make your life easy. So all those people that say to you, hey, don't go to a course, you can do it by yourself. They don't know what they're talking about. They're literally setting you up for failure. Sometimes you need people to simplify stuff for you. Sometimes your life is a lot easy if you have someone that could put those notes, that can support you, that cares for you, and that could make your life easy. So... Let's go. And there is no shame in asking for help. Definitely, those that ask for help tend to do well in life. You cannot succeed on your own. You always need people. Okay, let's look at this. So two things. Blue. Blue. Very good statement from Lucy Craven. There's no shame whatsoever asking for help. No shame whatsoever. Please ask as much help as you can. Use these tools to determine um, the risk prior and during anticoagulation. So for those of you that don't know, the chat bus is a tool that will assess your risk of, of, um, of having a clot, of having a stroke, sorry. So to assess the risk of stroke, we use chat bus tool. In the GPS exam, they will need you to know what each one stands for. So what C stands for, what H stands for, all of this represents one of the parameters, okay, that are being measured that show your risk of stroke. So you have to learn what each of them is you also have to learn the scores from each of them. You have to learn how to calculate, how to calculate chat bus scores. Even in my video on YouTube, we had something, a calculation on there. 
I'll, I'll pull one on here for you guys as well later on in the class. But um, you have to learn how to calculate your scores. And um, that's very important, okay? So in terms of stroke, you have different tools. You have Atria Stroke Risk Tool. You have Q Stroke Calculator. But the main one they focus on, which I'm going to test you on, most likely is going to be the Chad Vast Tool. So definitely learn the Chad Vast. And then with the Bleeding Risk, you've got Orbit, you've got Hasbled, you've got Atria. But um, these two are the ones that you want to learn, definitely. Orbit is the most um, efficient one now, but it's still being em embedded into Pathways. So many people are still not using this yet. So definitely learn Hasbled because that's the one that has been going all these years. So uh, when do we give anticoagulation? So this helps you to tell when to give someone anticoagulation. So if you do the chat vast, anything that is above two, you give them anticoagulation. Doesn't matter if they're male or female. If you have a chat vast score that is two or above, you will have to give them anticoagulation. That means that they have a high risk of getting a stroke. So you have to give them that AF, you have to give them anticoagulation. If it's a male, zero, no anticoagulation. So Women, one, no anticoagulation, right? So anticoagulation for a man starts from one. If a man has got one, then you give them anticoagulation. If a woman starts from two, you give her anticoagulation. But generally, whether it's a male or a female, anytime you see any score that is two or more, regardless, anticoagulation. So in here, you have a memory trick, which is anticoagulants. So instead of anticoagulants, Think and two coagulants, so remember that two, obviously not for males, because male is one, but generally anything that is two and above, regardless, you don't even need to think about it, whether it's a male or female, anticoagulation straight away. If everyone is given anticoagulation at the start of AF treatment, why is the stroke risk assessment required? No, no, not everyone is given anticoagulation. So Nims is asking if everyone is given anticoagulation at the start of AF treatment, then why is the stroke um, risk assessment required? Because if a patient has a high risk of um, aren't they and they given anticoagulant again. So not everyone will be given an anticoagulant, right? So generally majority of patients, right? You have to um, find out the risk of stroke and then you give them anticoagulants. So you will see that although we say yes, like if you have, obviously if you have like, um, yes, if it's a new onset and if it's, um, hemodynamic is stable and things that like you give them heparins, you definitely give them anticoagulants. But there are some patients that you don't necessarily have to give them an anticoagulant because they have very, 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 very low risk, of almost zero risk of getting a stroke. But yes, generally you see majority of the patients will have it, okay? But you don't have to always give anticoagulants. And yes, so I'll give an example of some that you could give them, um, the sum that, yes, you could just give um, rather than electrical cardioversion, you could give them some rate control. There's some patients that would just be managed just on rate control, right? And rate control, you don't really have to give them any anticoagulants. They will be fine without. So it all depends. Anticoagulants is when you've also done the assessment. It's when you've done the assessment and you found that out, then you give them. And that's why we say like, Cardioversion, you have to give anticoagulants because of the risk of stroke. But if a patient wasn't having cardioversion, they did not need cardioversion. They were just going to have rate control. You're just going to give them some beta blockers. Then you need to assess. And if they don't have a risk of stroke, then the beta blockers will be fine. You don't have to give them anticoagulants. Okay. So it's mainly, yes, the electric um, cardioversions for this case. So great stuff. That, is that clear? Good. What type would you give warfarin, Norax, heparin? Is the anticoagulant dose different for AF? Yes, we're going to look at anticoagulant doses in a separate um, class because it's very important to come up in your exam. We're going to look at doses and you have to learn those that come up, especially for AF and stroke. Yes, we'll look at that. I have a good table for you. So don't worry about that. All covered for you. All covered. So what type do you give? So we'll normally give, um, we'll normally give the, the DOAX first, right? Because the DOAX are better than warfarin. Right, so we'll look at those, those as well. So anticoagulants, so two, that just means that anything from two with chat vas, you give them anticoagulants. And one for men, anticoagulants. So you definitely need to learn all of this. So the C here stands for congestive heart failure, hypertension, H, age, age, the two ages, so be careful. There's an age which is greater than 75, that's a score of two. So greater than or equal to 75 is a score of two, while between 65 and 74 is one. So please learn those that are two. That's why we have two. Two things that are two are S. You have two S's. One S, which is a female, is one. And one S here, which is for stroke. TIA has got two, two point scores of two. So please learn, or you have to learn these risk factors, and you also have to learn the scores. 
definitely, because they do ask questions and calculations and those questions have come up in the exam. So um, in this place, I just not um, to not confuse you, when we talk about vascular disease, what do we mean? These are examples of what we mean by vascular disease. So the patients had a previous heart attack, peripheral arterial disease, these are all considered as vascular disease. Do we have to memorize this table? Yes. Yes, definitely. You have to memorize this. You definitely have to memorize this table. You have to memorize what this means. You have to memorize the scores and they ask you different questions based on that. They could just ask you a question instead of a risk factor and ask you which of these is not a risk factor for um, stroke for the chat basque. And you, so you need to know which one or they're gonna ask you to calculate to work out the scores, all right? So please learn it. What is the score for men? So the score for men is normally zero. That means that no risk is normally zero. For men is zero. But anything for men above zero, then you have to give them anticoagulant. So if a man has, a male has a score of one, you give them anticoagulant. Okay, Abdul Samad. Can I see slide 31? Yes, this is slide 31. Slide 31 was just showing the definition of vascular disease because you've got vascular disease here. And you may be asking, what is vascular disease? So this is just to help you to know examples of what we mean by vascular disease. So the GPS can give you an example in an exam where they wouldn't just put vascular disease or so the patient previously had um, a heart attack. So you need to know that that's vascular disease and that's a score of one when you're calculating. So if a patient has had a stroke and a thromboembolism, for EG, would they get um, a score of four? No, so it's normally two, it's normally two. So this just means any of them, right? So if they have a stroke, they have a TIA thromboembolism, it's always a score of two, all right? You don't add this up. You don't have a stroke and a thromboembolism and a TIA. These are all the same things, to be honest. So it's just a score of two. Okay, so do you do the chart pass when patients admitted and give the antiquary before rate or rhythm control yes so you always have to assess the risk for stroke that's what we said the moment you admit them to the hospital and they've got af you have to then work out the risk of stroke for that patient and if that patient has a chadva score which is um anything above zero for men or anything above one for women then you have to give them anticoagulation which is normally um starting off with a doac doac right so Orbits, orbits. So this is the one that may come up because it's new. So the my one is to make sure that you know about this. But at the same time, it may not come up because it's new, right? So sometimes new things come up. Sometimes they don't come up because they're new. So um, and they might need more time. But you need to also learn the same thing like the Chadva score. You need to learn what orbit stands for. So all of this. Didn't you say given parenteral heparin before? Oh. I think um, Ash, no, go through that. When you go through that, I don't want to go back into that again, but. I spoke about giving parenteral heparin when I was talking about if you had to do um, say cardioversion, right, electrical. But generally, generally it's an emergency. You give parenteral for more serious emergencies of treatment. If not, if it's not an emergency situation, then you will give them oral, oral DOAC, okay? You give them oral. So all that, so you learn this um, always for all the so anyone that is greater than 74 is one. So this is again, memorization like we did with Chadvas. Please memorize this as well. So someone's asking, explain above zero for men. So to make it easy for you, to make it easy for you, let me go back here. Let me just go back here. So if the score for men, for men, if a man's score is zero, if you've done the Chadvas and it's zero, you don't give any anticoagulant. If you do the Chadvas score, say for instance, you did the Chadvas score and that man was, he had hypertension, right? So if it was a male and he only had hypertension, that means his Chadvas score will be one. So if the Chadvas score is one, he will need anticoagulant, you'll give him a DOAC. So these are the ones that you don't give anything, but anything above this, if the score is one, two, three, four, five, then you give them anticoagulant. If the female is two, three, four, five, et cetera, you give an anticoagulant. If the score of a man is zero, if the score of a female is one, there is no point giving an anticoagulant because that means that they don't have any risk of stroke. Make sense? So that was a question from Akinola. Akinola, let me know if that makes sense. Uh, Monica says some questions are throwing off the current slides, kind of distracting, okay. Shall we collect? Yes, I think we'll have to move on because yes, yeah, some of those questions are going back and I really don't want to go back. I want to go forward. 
But you could ask those questions. If you've got some more questions, please ask in the Telegram group. If not, we wouldn't go too far. Shall we collect our questions and ask it towards the end? Yes, maybe the questions at the end. But no, ask the questions, but I'm going to probably do some more at the end. Okay, so um, with this with this one, Obit, please learn this for Obit. Learn this the same way like your chat verse. Learn this and learn the score as well. Maximum score, obviously, is seven. That means that if someone has all of these things, the maximum score they can get is seven, right? But learn this. So what you need to know for Obit is what does this represent? So this is the risk of bleeding, right? Chad Vass was the risk of stroke. Now this is the risk of bleeding. So it's important you know someone's risk of bleeding because if the risk of bleeding is so high, then you don't want to give them an anticoagulant. Or perhaps you might give them a very reduced dose or a very short dose, or you might just have to monitor them effectively. So that's why it's important to also know the risk of bleeding as well as the risk of stroke. So if you work out the risk of bleeding, then this is how you interpret the results. So if the score comes out as between zero to two, so say for instance, the person had only one thing and that person was older than, was 76 years old. The patient was 76 years old and they didn't have any of these. They didn't have any of this. The only, they were just 75 years old or 76. Then that patient is going to have a score of one, which means that that patient doesn't have a risk of bleeding. So it's fine. You could give them an anticoagulant without worrying that this patient is going to bleed. Okay. Does that make sense? Give me a three, give me a three, give me a three. That's what the bleed is all about. So, you know, you could give the anticoagulant without worrying. But if that patient had a score of three, then that's medium. You've got to be really careful and monitor them. If they have a score of four to seven, then a very high risk of bleeding. So you're better not either giving the anticoagulant or perhaps maybe giving a parenteral one, one that you can stop quickly, or you might just have to reduce that dose. Or depending on how serious it is, you may have to go for an antiplatelet instead. So these are, that's how you interpret your results. Do we need to know both orbit and a has for exam? Yes. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it's always been has blood, but now orbit has been introduced. So that's why I was saying the new, um, they could ask you something because it's new or they may not ask you because it's too new. So they may not ask you orbit because it's new, they're gonna ask you has blood. So in all the questions, of, all the exam questions last year, cause this was introduced like in the summer around June, June, July last year, they didn't ask this in any of the exams. All right, so they may ask you guys, or they might still say because they're not really incorporated in all pathways yet, they might think, let's stick to Hasbled. So the best thing for you is to learn both Hasbled and Orbit. Orbit will definitely take over anyway, so you may as well learn Orbit with it. So the tool Hasbled, um, has um, good mnemonic is three. So three makes you bleed. So anything that is three and above, it means that you have a high risk of bleeding. So here with the um, Orbit, we said anything between four to seven is high risk of bleeding with has bled from three onwards. So this is the table for has bled. These are all the um, parameters for has bled, hypertension, and it's also has bled. Everything represents something. So make sure that when you're learning, you learn what this is. So what does the H stand for in has bled? What does A stand for? And this, and those are the scores as well. So most of the time it's chat vast that comes up compared to has bled in terms of calculations and knowing risk factors but definitely you want to learn this, learn your risk factors. So what do I mean by one or two? So one or two means that if the patient has got both, all right? So the all one, the good thing about um, has bled, all of them are one. So all the scores are one. Where you see me put one or two, that means if this patient has got an abnormal liver, uh, abnormal kidneys and abnormal liver, then it's two, okay? That's what one or two means. Or in this case, if the patient's probably taking two of these drugs, aspirin and an NSAID, which you shouldn't really, but in that case of alcohol, then it's two. Are we supposed to memorize the scores as well? Yes. Memorize the risk factors and memorize the scores because they might need you to work them out. Definitely memorize both. Okay, so, and in this one as well, hypertension is different. We're going to look at hypertension later on. Most of you will know hypertension. We normally look at 140 systolic equals to or greater than 140. And, but here, when they talk about hypertension, they're talking about greater than 160. And even in the chat vas, it's still, hypertension here is still 140 over 90, but hypertension in, in um, has bled is actually 160 for systolic. What does label INR mean? Label INR is just more, um, it's to do with, um, the normalized ratio, we're gonna look at that when we do, um, we'll look into warfarin, but GPC will give you that, right? So it's really to do with um, how you like, the ratio, how you normalize the blood. So we'll look into that when we get into um, warfarin, but that's what you use, right? Your INR is just like your normal INR. So um, 
to side of the point is a quick one to learn as well. This is a type of arrhythmia, right? When you guys are gonna see the GPS likes asking questions on QT interval prolongation, it's a very important side effects. You need to know which drugs cause them, okay? So what is to side of the point is, it is a type of arrhythmia, normally to do with lack of oxygen in a way. So it's, um, it's a type of arrhythmia, heartbeats are irregular, and it's usually very fast and not enough oxygen is pumped around the blood, the body. So your brain is gonna be starved of oxygen. So it could lead to um, fainting and also death. So it's quite serious. All right, so causes could be a lot of stress. It could be strenuous exercise, drugs, sotalol. Sotalol is one that may come up. One of the common side effects or one of the side effects that stands out with sotalol is QT interval prolongation because most of your other beta blockers don't really cause QT interval prolongation, but the naughty child does. So um, watch out for that. Sotalol is a beta blocker that causes QT interval prolongation. Um, hypokalemia. So um, hypokalemia could predispose you to getting... Um, QT interval prolongation to get into side of the pointers. So low potassium could be dangerous. It could lead to an arrhythmia. Um, treatment to use IV magnesium sulfate. So you need to know which drugs. GPHC blue. Blue people, it has come up in the GPS exam. They've asked a question on which of these drugs causes QT interval prolongation. So give me examples of drugs that cause QT inter. If you don't know, put a zero. If you don't put the answer down. Erythromycin is a very good one. That's one that comes up as well on the exam. I've got zero from Ali. So I'm going to give you guys a mnemonic. Do you guys want a mnemonic? Give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one. Those of you that are on the course in October, you probably know that mnemonic already. It's A, B, C, D, D, E. Okay, A, B, C, D, D, E. However you want to say that. So um, A stands for anti-arrhythmic drugs. So amiodarone, sotalol, flaconide, B, in their anti B biotics, quinolones, macrolides. Macrolides come up a lot in the exam as well. So watch out for that with QT interval prolongation. There's actually an MHR warning on that. I will forever pray for you, Marvin. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zena. Thank you. I'm sending you back love. Please pray for me. That's all I can ask for. Prayers mean more to me than anything else in life. Pray for me and I'll be happy. So antipsychotics, anti pray for me that I live longer so that we can finish the course. <laughs> so antipsychotics, right? C, antipsychotics, haloperidol, antidepressants. The reason why this mnemonic is so good is because there are just so many drugs out there that cause QT interval prolongation. So just by knowing the general groups, it could help you in an exam question to pick out, they could give you a list of drugs and you have to choose which one causes QT interval prolongation. So just by knowing these groups, then you could easily um, know the answer. Even if you didn't know the specific drug, if you knew that that drug, apparently that was an antipsychotic, then you go, oh yes, definitely QT interval prolongation. So great stuff, exam question there. So we're going to look at amiodarone. Very easy. These slides, you're going to enjoy them. They're easy. People, we have been here for a while. We had so many questions, but we are smashing. Amiodarone, what is the dose for amiodarone? This has also come up in an exam question. So 200 milligrams three times a day to begin with, then 200 milligrams twice a day, then 200 milligrams three times a day. No. 200 milligrams three times a day for one week, then 200 milligrams twice a day for one week, then 200 milligrams once a day, maintenance. So someone's asked about doses and things. These are the, we're gonna show you the doses that you definitely need to learn. This is one of them. All right, learn this stuff. Aliyah says, so if drugs cause QT interval prolongation, does it mean that they also would cause hypokalemia or not always? Oh no, very good question. It doesn't mean that they will cause hypokalemia, but if you gave them with drugs that cause hypokalemia, that's an interaction. They'll increase the risk of QT interval prolongation. So for instance, if you gave some antipsychotic with um, a diuretic like furosemide, because that causes hypokalemia. So drugs that cause hypokalemia, if you give them other drugs that you know cause QT interval, then there's a very, very um, high risk of um, causing QT interval prolongation, right? So very, very good. So what are the side effects of amiodarone? Someone has got um, a mnemonic. So um, I've changed my mnemonic because I think it's one of the things that got me into trouble with Zoom. <laughs> so I'm not going to say you're saying it yourself, the mnemonic. If you want to know a mnemonic, I've changed the mnemonic, mnemonic on the slide. You are saying it, not me. Because when I say it, Zoom says, that's it. We're going to cut you off. So Many of you love this mnemonic because it's class, right? So I've changed the mnemonic, but it's still the same thing. I'll let you say yourself. So this is the mnemonic for amiodarone. Learn this drug. It comes up in your exams a lot. It is a very important, it's high risk. Learn amiodarone, everything you can about it. All right? Yes, Zoom Big Brother is watching. So amiodarone, side effects. Amy is a photogenic female dog. 
<laughs> I didn't say you said it. So what does P stand for? Photosensitivity, bradycardia, intestinal lung disease, thyroid, it could cause hyper and hypothyroidism, corneal, so micro deposits, it could dazzle you if you drive at night, hepatic, liver problems. So these are some of the side effects, important side effects of amiodarone, and these come up in your exam. So please learn this stuff, learn this stuff, learn this stuff, learn this stuff. The next slides, you've gone through the hardest slides, everything will be easy, you will be laughing, you will be chilling. She's wearing a scarf. How many of you like Amy? Amy looks cool, doesn't she? She's like ready for the summer. <laughs> so Amy is trying to help you to learn everything you can. Amir Daron, that came up in the exam. It does come up in your exam. So side effects, micro, um, corneal micro deposits. They could ask you which of these drugs um, dazzles um, headlights at night, right? Which of these drugs could cause dazzling of headlights at night? That is Amir Daron, right? So you could reverse it when you stop the treatment. It could cause hypo and hyperthyroidism. Please learn not just one of them, both of them. It contains iodine, which can cause, um, affect your thyroid glands. Gracelet skin, that's correct. So you need to have SP, anything above SPF 30. But yes, it could affect your skin, shield yourself from sunlight. Hepatotoxicity, it could affect your liver. So it could cause signs. You need to learn your signs and symptoms of liver toxicity. It comes up in your exam as well. Yeah, she is a very posh dog. You need to learn your signs and symptoms. So dark urine, these things that you see here, and nausea and vomiting, jaundice, abdominal pain, malaise, raised liver enzymes. Please learn these. They come up in the exam asking you some of those symptoms for hepatotoxicity. It could also cause pulmonary toxicity. When we talk about pulmonary toxicity, learn the symptoms, shortness of breath, coughing. Optic neuropathy, blindness. It could impair your vision. Peripheral neuropathy. So it could cause tingling in your hands and your feet, extremities. These are side effects of amiodarone. Someone mentioned about gray slate skin. Yes, phototoxicity. So um, what you have to advise patients is to protect the skin against sunlight and use a good sun protection factor cream. Contraindication, we mentioned amiodarone contains iodine. It contains iodine, good way to remember, IOD. It contains iodine. So iodine, think of thyroid, iodine, iodine. So in here, in terms of the contraindications, anyone that's got any thyroid dysfunction, don't give them amiodarone. And anyone that's got iodine sensitivity because it contains iodine. Monitoring. Monitoring comes up on these drugs. Most of these drugs, you will see that all these slides, I'm giving you things where GPS could test you. Um, monitoring, you need to know your monitoring parameters. We've mentioned a lot about thyroid function. So obviously you have to monitor thyroid glands. Monitor the liver, we mentioned about hepatic toxicity six months and then um, before treatment and then every six months. Monitor potassium levels, it can cause hypokalemia. Um, chest x-ray for the chest and um, shortness of breath and all of that. Annual eye test, we mentioned can affect your vision, ECG for the heart, blood pressure. So these are things that you monitor amiodarone. Amiodarone, they like asking questions as well, learn everything and everything, any question they're gonna ask you will be on this slide. So measure about protecting your skin from sunlight, gray slate skin, using at least SPF 30. Seek medical attention if the following symptoms develop. So GPC likes asking you um, patient and care advice questions as well. So when you're doing your revision and you're going through my slides, always look out for patient and care advice because they love asking you questions because these are the advice um, counseling that you give patients when they come into the pharmacy. So they love to see how you're going to perform, if the, what advice you give patients if they came into the pharmacy. So patient care advice, watch out for this slides every time on the course. So is this clear? Give me a one, give me a one, give me a one. Give me a one. It's going to be straightforward. If patient say, let me see. Someone's asking if a patient is severely asthmatic. So if they're severe and taking amiodarone, would that be a referral? Yes. Yeah, so if they're severely asthmatic, you really want to check that because that could make it worse, shortness of breath. So yes, that would be a referral. You probably not even give them amiodarone. Okay. Very good question. Like how you're connecting it. Um, interactions, you guys ask me, oh, what interactions? You need to learn interactions and things like that. Yes, there are. You don't learn all the interactions. You learn the most important interactions. And these, and, and how do you know those? Because I will be showing those on all the slides as we go through. 
So interactions, it has a very long half-life. That's very specific with amiodarone, for instance. So even when you stop the medication for several months, you can still get it interacting with drugs, even though you stop taking amiodarone. So interactions could occur several weeks or months even after stopping the drug. Increased plasma concentration with warfarin, digoxin, cyclosporin, phenytoin. Lithium is an important one. So increased risk of lithium arrhythmias. So lithium could also cause QT interval prolongation. Um, statins, um, generally, if you give amiodarone with a statin, it could increase the risk of muscle pain. And then what we mentioned, drugs that cause QT interval prolongation. So amiodarone interacts with these. So straightforward, is that straightforward? Give me one straightforward reading, not in complex understand. Give me one, give me one, give me one. Yes, people! Great stuff. Now we're gonna go into my best medication. How many of you are ready for Dijoxin? Two kidneys, if you watch my YouTube. How many of you watch my YouTube video with two kidneys? If you watch it, give me a three. It, is, it was fun, isn't it? It just summarizes everything easy. Now everyone is using that mnemonic. Everywhere I go, everyone is using two kidneys. So, um, great stuff. Say bismillah, bismillah, must must say, say bismillah, bismillah, must. So two kidneys, two kidneys, two kidneys. So here we go. Um, what does it stand for? I'm gonna explain that later on. Watch my YouTube video. You guys will see what it means. But it's such a good way to remember. It's like a good overview of um, digoxin. It's a good overview of digoxin. So does anyone want me to explain what two kidneys mean, or do you want me to go straight into the next slide? So you'll see that anyway, you will learn it. Watch my video, watch the video on YouTube. Just go Marvin Munzi or Previous Shortcuts, type in two kidneys and you see. Someone wants me to explain what is it. Okay, so let me say, okay, you're gonna see that later on overview. Two means that this is normally the range, the range, you need to know your ranges. So anything between like one or two is a therapeutic range, right? For um, amiodarone because it's now a therapeutic. Um, P is for positive um, inotropic drug. So it increases the force of contraction of the heart. Also, P means that the most important is potassium. Wow! Who put that down there all oh, my life? Who put that? Let me see. Let me see. Who is this? This is just amazing. Who put this? I'm not going to explain. Moss, do you guys know what? Just read what Moss has. I'm just going to, yes, Moss is way down there. Just read that. Read that because that's exactly the explanation. It's right there. I'm not going to go through it. That is what Moss has put down. Look at the comments. Oh, but he put it just to panelists. Moss, change that to panelists and attendees so that everyone can see what you just wrote. So this is potassium, most important electrolyte. Low potassium increases digoxin toxicity. I have means um, positively inotropic drugs, so it increases the contraction, the force of contraction of the heart. Um, D, what does D mean again? What does it mean? Digoxin toxicity. It means digoxin toxicity. Um, M stands for nausea. MS is vomiting, nausea and vomiting, common side effects of digoxin. Y stands for yellow vision. And then S stands for sparing, potassium sparing diuretic because you need to have a potassium sparing diuretic with this so that you don't have low potassium because low potassium causes toxicity. Great stuff. Moz, big up to you for that. Thanks for this, Moz. That is very good. So um, increases the force of contraction. So everything I've said, I'm going to go through the slides. Very, very easy, straightforward slides. It's just a matter of reading through them. So increases the force of myocardial, con uh, myocardial contra contraction. It simply increases the force of contraction of your heart. That's why it's good for heart failure because when your heart fails, it makes it pump stronger, okay? So, and decreases heart rate by reducing conductivity in the AV node. It's quite useful in controlling ventricular response in persistent and permanent AF. We mentioned in rate control that you can use digoxin, especially um, to help to maintain, um, especially patients that live a sedentary lifestyle, right? Those that don't exercise, don't move around. And it has a very important role in heart failure. In the management of AF maintenance dose, so you have a maintenance dose, it's normally determined. So how do you determine um, in the maintenance dose for digoxin? So digoxin could have a loading dose. You have different doses, which we're gonna look at later on. But in order to determine the dose, you have to do that while the heart is at rest, okay? So like sedentary at rest, and that should never fall below 60 beats per minute. So it should never go into a bradycardia mode. So um, not much to take away that statement. It just says that, um, you have to measure to get um, the maintenance dose. You need to first measure 
um, ventricular rate at rest. The Joxin is really used for rapid control of heart rate. It takes a long time to work as well. So if you want something that could control your rate or rate control very quickly, you don't want to go for the Joxin. More of things like your um, calcium, your limiting calcium channel blockers that we looked at on that rate control or beta blockers. But the Joxin takes a little while. So um, it's not really a drug that you want to use if you want a rapid effect. Intramuscular um, rotation is not recommended. Okay, so a loading dose. So sometimes for some conditions, you need a loading dose, while for other conditions, you don't need a loading dose. So a loading dose is not required in patients with heart failure who are in sinus rhythm, right? A satisfactory digoxin concentration can be achieved over a period of about a week. So yes, yeah, so you have, um, so with some drugs like this, you have to load them up and then you sort of slowly then tame them down over maintenance. But the joxin based on the condition is very important that you learn this. So if you're looking at maintenance for atrial fibrillation, so if you're using the joxin for atrial fibrillation, then you need to have a loading dose. And the dose is normally one to five. I think someone's asking us about doses. These are the doses that definitely need to learn. So maintenance dose of AF is normally one to five to 250. So it's the higher dose. So if you see a higher dose of the joxin, which is 250 or one to five, then it's most likely going to be um, used for AF. If you see the dose, which is 6 to 2.5 to say 1 to 5, if it's a lower dose, then it's most likely being used for um, heart failure. So in heart failure, um, there's no need for having um, a loading dose just for AF. And normally um, elderly, like most drugs with elderly patients, you'd need to reduce the dose because this, do this drug is excreted renally via your kidneys. So with elderly patients, they have a higher risk of having renal impairment. And so they could have, they could, have toxicity very easily, right? So you have to reduce the dose for elderly patients. This is um, just from the BNF. So it's just a, some indications and the dose what I've shown you there, just to help you to at least know that it's important to learn certain doses. And these are some of the doses of the joxin that is worth learning. But definitely um, just knowing that this one here requires um, a loading dose while this one doesn't. Okay, next one. Um, it has a long half-life, like I've, I've um, mentioned already. So um, because it has a long half-life, we give it once a day rather than twice a day. So that's straightforward. Drugs have a long half-life, you give them once a day. Um, higher doses, so sometimes um, they may suffer, like we mentioned, nausea and vomiting. So if a patient's having nausea, you could actually divide that dose into two. So you give it once a day, but if a patient's having side effects, they could give you a scenario because the GPC needs you to know what to do when things happen. They could give you a scenario where a patient is on the joxin and they're having nausea and will give you different options on what to do. Do you reduce the dose? Um, do you divide the dose? Do you stop it? So in this case, dividing it will reduce nausea. What if the patient has both AF and heart failure, which dose would you give? Very good question. I think if they have um, heart failure, then you, an AF, you give the higher dose. So if you looked at heart failure, you had between say six to 2.5 to one to five, and then AF you have one to five to 250. So even if you gave about one to five around that range, it will still be fine. Okay, I made good question. Dose is based on renal function. So you need to make sure that the patient's kidneys are working effectively. That's why with elderly patients, be careful. Um, Digoxin has different bioavailability, so different formulations. Digoxin comes in different forms. So you have IV, you have the Alexi, you have tablets, and they all have different bioavailabilities. What does that mean? That means that you can't just switch from one to the next. You have to convert them, right? So you can't just say, okay, um, this is what the tablet is. I'm going to change them to an injection. I'm going to give them the same amount, 250 micrograms of the tablet. I'll give them like 200 micro 50 grams of the injection. You have to convert it because they have different bioavailabilities. The joxin is a narrow therapeutic drug, right? So um, you definitely, definitely. Yes, Negan has put there, um, IV is 100%. Yeah, so IV is normally 100%. Alexi 75, um, tablet 90%. So I had that in the previous notes, but I need to check something about um, the Alexi. But I think 75%, I need to double check something on that one. But yeah, just out of curiosity, so IV 100%. Um, bioavailability, LX is around 75 and tablets about 90%. So digoxin is a narrow therapeutic drug. So what is the therapeutic range? Because you need to learn your narrow therapeutic drugs, they're all high-risk drugs. They will come up in your exam. 
So you have what you call a therapeutic range and a toxic range. Don't get them mixed up. Therapeutic range is where it works best, while a toxic range is where it starts producing its side effects. So generally, according to your BNF, the therapeutic range is one to two micrograms per liters. That means that within this range, you're going to get the best therapeutic effects from digoxin. However, um, anything above 1.5, once it starts going up 1.5, you also have to be very cautious because that's probably where you may start getting side effects. So definitely anything above two, you need to be very careful because there's a fine line with, with narrow therapeutic drugs between um, getting the therapeutic effect and suffering from toxicity. So that's why we monitor them very closely. So likelihood of toxicity increases progressively through this range. Does that make sense? Give me one, give me one. If this is straightforward, this is what it's going to be. We've done the hardest part, which was to do with arrhythmias. Everything else will be straightforward. Special care, like I've mentioned, with your elderly patients, because elderly patients normally will, are more susceptible to digitalist toxicity because the kidneys are not as effective, so the drug could build up, so they have a higher chance of toxicity. So you, definitely, you want to reduce the dose in elderly patients. Hypokalemia, we mentioned the most important electrolyte for digoxin is probably potassium. It is potassium because low potassium causes digoxin toxicity. So it's like an inversely proportional relationship. If one goes down, the other one goes up. So that's the reason why you always give digoxin with spironolactone because you don't want the Bollywood dance. Yeah, that's the Bollywood dance, people. To Merezindagi. That's the Bollywood dance. So um, you want to make sure that there isn't too, you don't you have enough potassium because if your potassium is too low, then you're going to get digoxin toxicity. Other ones that may come up in your exam is magnesium. So just like potassium, low magnesium will lead to digoxin toxicity. Right, very very important. Ria says, and that's why Amelia interacts with digoxin as a cause. Fantastic! You're making connections right there, right there, right there. So, and all of these low potassium drugs can also increase the risk of QT interval prolongation. So, um, so watch out for potassium, watch out for magnesium, watch out for calcium. Calcium is hyper, not hypo, and then hypoxia. So these four things are so important. They have come up in exam questions. So potassium, magnesium, calcium, oxygen. These four are so important when it comes to um, digoxin. Give potassium sparing directly because you don't want to be low in potassium or potassium supplements. If toxicity occurs, so the GPC needs you to know what to do when things happen. They need you to learn antidotes. We're getting more and more questions from the GPC asking about antidotes. So for instance, we're offering, which we're going to look at later on, vitamin K, and then we're going to look at antidotes for your DOAX. In this case, um, an antidote for digoxin, if you have too much digoxin, digoxin overdose, you give something called DGFAB, which is digoxin-specific antibody fragments. So they need you to know these things and they could ask in the exam. Okay, if someone has too much digoxin and you want to withdraw, you either withdraw the digoxin, you stop it, or if you want to reverse the effects, then you have to give them an antidote, which is digoxin-specific antibody fragments. So Alice asking, 1.5 is fine within the range. Why toxic? So, so 1.5 is fine. Yeah, so the range says 1.5 to 3. But um, what we're saying is, although it says that, normally you need to start, be, you have to start being cautious once you start going above 1.5. Okay, so the therapeutic range is one to two. It doesn't, so within one to two be fine, but it's just saying from this point onwards, once you start going above 1.5, then you need to start becoming cautious. But once you're still between one to 1 1.5, you're in a good place. Great. Is it the same as DigiBind? Um, DigiBind, no, is it DigiBind? DigiFab, fragment, DigiFab. Is it DigiBind? I have to check the brand name. I think it's DigiFab. DigiBind, I have to check that. It's DigiFab, yes. Okay, um, let's go next one. What are the signs of digital toxicity? This was an exam question, people in blue. They love asking the vision, especially because it's yellow and that stands out. If you look at those signs and symptoms, many of them are common with other drugs. So there are certain um, signs that stand out with certain drugs. And one of those is yellow vision. And that's why sometimes GPC likes to ask sort of questions because they don't want to ask you questions that are ambiguous, that will need that will one or two answers are correct. They want a question where just one answer is correct. So if they're going to ask for side effects, most likely going to be something like yellow vision because you know straight away it is digoxin and not anything else. Sick and slow. Okay, great stuff. What do we monitor with digoxin? I've mentioned some of them already. 
that's what you monitor. So is every narrow therapeutic drug, you have to monitor um, the plasma concentration. Definitely blood samples are taken to check. Several electrolytes, we've mentioned um, certain electrolytes, important ones, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and then put oxygen in there, okay? Those four are so important. Learn them. This comes up in your exam. Being out function, the kidney is the most important um, organ. So for digoxin, so renal impairment, if a patient's got renal impairment, you want to reduce the dose or not give them digoxin at all. So what are some of the important drug interactions? There are so many interactions in the BNF, but again, I'm going to show you the most important ones that do come up in your exam. So for digoxin, it is a matter of learning. So I've got someone say crashed, crazed. Yes, that's a mnemonic I use. Did you mention oxygen? Yes, hypoxia low oxygen, right? Hypoxia, I mentioned that with digoxin. So I wouldn't go back, but check that chemo, hypoxia. So drugs which reduce renal excretion, NSAIDs, drugs which decrease digoxin, enzyme inducers. So it's a matter of just learning these drugs. There's no other way around it. This is the, it's not even explaining, explaining it. It's not complex, it's just memorizing it. So what you do is you have a memory trick, which some people have put down, but Visha has got my memory trick there. Crazed. Crazed is a good memory trick. So for um, important drug interactions, again, I'm trying to make life easy for you because if you do this by yourself, you're going to go, Marvin, what drugs I need to learn? What doses do we need to learn? What interactions do we need to learn? You don't need to worry about that because I am showing you throughout the course on the different slides. So it's a typical example of the interactions that you want to learn because these come up in your exam. All right. Especially if you come up with digoxin interaction, it will be one of these. And craze is um, a good mnemonic that you can use to help you make life easy for yourself. How many of you are, are with me so far? How many of you are you like, wow, we're almost here for two hours. We are going. How many of you want me to keep going? Give me a two, give me a two, give me a two. It only gets easy from here. I started off with the difficult stuff when your brain was fresh. Everything else is just straightforward stuff. Bleeding disorders, we're going to touch on this a little bit, and then we're going to touch on it later um, more. On to 10. Do you guys want to go on to 10 p.m.? <laughs> Let me know if you want to go on to 10 p.m. We're going to go for it. I'm a soldier, right? So people are like, no, my brain is fried. What's the time? Let me see what my time is on here. Wow, two minutes. No, I'm going to use this other time. I've got five more minutes. <laughs> five more minutes. So let's look at this, um, antifibrinolytic drugs and hemostatics, right? So these are drugs that stop you from bleeding, right? Antifibrinolytic, and I don't know why, it's such, a, it's such a very small chapter, but for some reason, you always get questions as well on the exam. So watch out for tranexamic acid. You also have this coming up in OTC questions, all right? So watch out for this question. So, um, Inhibit, so learn about tranexamic acid, learn about the dose, learn about what it does. It stops you from bleeding in a nutshell, right? So it prevents bleeding. It can be used um, in surgery or dental extraction. Management of periods, right? So if you have heavy bleeding periods, then if you have the heavy periods, then this drug could be used to reduce that. All right, and then you need to learn the dose. It's one gram three times a day, but for up to four days. So if you see that those one gram um, three times a day for four days in your pharmacy, then it's most likely given to reduce um, bleeding period, period, um, periods, basically heavy periods. So using angioedema epistasis, but um, definitely you want to learn questions come up on the dose on this and also um, the use in menorrhagia. Great, guys, I have kids. Do not suggest 10, please. No, we're not going to go to 10. We're not going to next time. I think we took some time because there were a lot of questions at the beginning, but that's fine. That's fine. We're still on track. All right. So I've got three minutes. I'm using this time. I'm three minutes and then I'm going to stop and then we'll continue on Sunday. Okay. VT is a very big one. Comes up in every exam as well. All these things I'm showing you. So that's why the cardiovascular is so important. Questions in the exam. If you smash cardiovascular, you smash almost about 30 to percent of your questions that will come up. Loads on cardiovascular. So um, what are the two types, PE and DVT? If you don't know, put a zero, people. So pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis. Know the difference. Pulmonary embolism is basically a clot in the lungs, while deep vein thrombosis is a clot in the lower self part of your body, mainly in your legs. So a clot in your legs is what we call DVT, 
while a clot in the lungs is what we call a PE. So a clot can move, can move from, uh, from your legs all the way to the lungs and that becomes a PE, pulmonary embolism. So memory trick for you, I'm putting this down because people always get confused between antiplatelets and anticoagulants. Many people mix them up. They don't know the difference. They call um, antiplatelets anticoagulants. They call anticoagulants antiplatelets, but not for you people. Family members, you lovely people, you special, special lovely crew. Not for you. Others may be confused, but not you. So the best way I have that to represent is antiplatelets are for smaller conditions, lighter conditions like the guns, right? An antiplatelet is like a gun. An antiplatelet, you look at aspirin, clopidogrel. Aspirin, clopidogrel, dipyridamol are the most popular antiplatelets. Those three, these are what we call antiplatelets. Don't mix them up. Don't call them anticoagulants, right? They are antiplatelets. And they normally for, yes, tigacrelo is one as well as an antiplatelet. Normally used, but those main three ones are aspirin, clopidogrel, and dipyridamol. So these are like for just like light sort of coagulation situations, okay? You don't, so they're the smaller guys, right? Anticoagulants are like bazookas. Right, so a bit stronger than guns, but um, so things like warfarin, rivaroxaban are stronger, right? So that's why you see them more in AF rather than antiplatelets. You don't use antiplatelets in AF. You use antiplatelets mainly in um, ACS, which we're gonna look at later on, but not in um, strokes and things like that. Um, anticoagulants, warfarin, rivaroxaban, a bit stronger, so you will see them in strokes. And then thrombolytics are like atomic bombs. They're the strongest. They just like break everything. You just smash everything, smash every single thing and have a very high risk of bleeding. Example, out of place. And that's what you're going to see in um, stroke as well. Okay. So it's just knowing the difference, knowing examples and knowing the strengths of each of them. So I think I am going to stop on this slide and then we're going to continue here on Sunday. So all patients, every single patient that's admitted to hospital needs to be assessed for the risk of VT and bleeding, all right? Why? Because everyone that is admitted to hospital, you may be lying down on your bed for a while. You may be bed bound, most likely. And if you're bed bound, you have a high risk of getting a clot in your leg. So because of that, every single person that's admitted into hospital has to be assessed for the risk of VT. On admission, and most of them will then have stockings until you become mobile again. So we will stop here. How many of you enjoy the session? Give me a three. We have, there's been quite a lot that I've given you on this. I'm telling you almost, you've learned so much good stuff. When you're gonna be answering questions, many of you are gonna go back to AF and you're gonna go, wow, I'm so happy I had this class. Because when you watch the AF, when you go through learning again AF, watching this video, it will make total sense to you. While your colleagues and your friends will not even have a clue. So on Sunday, we're going to be back. We're going to continue from this slide. The rest of the slides are easy to follow. You have done like probably, probably the hardest part for me in cardiovascular system is arrhythmias. After that, everything else is so easy. Will we have access to this lecture tomorrow? Yes, so within 24 hours, you will get the replay video within 24 hours. So if you've not had a video by this time tomorrow, by 10 o'clock tomorrow, you can send us an email, okay? So make sure you learn, you learn, you learn. Cameroon lost to Egypt. Oh, don't talk about it, I'm depressed. Don't talk about it, don't wipe me up. I'm Cameroonian, just read Cameroon, I just said. May, um, yes, and Marvin, this is just, so if you have any questions, please ask, please ask. I think we'll leave questions at the end is good, isn't it? So we had more questions before. I didn't want to, the reason why I had to answer those questions, I know there are many questions, but it's because I think that's one area that is quite difficult. So that's why I had to spend some time on those. But generally I'll say most time we'll do at the end, but I just felt like it would be that very difficult for me to get to the end and answer questions on arrhythmia. It's one of those that you want to get there and then. And Marvin, this is just a message for you. Previously, I had a look at the video slides on this chapter, but I saw that these slides today have been rearranged. Yes, and there were some slides missing, from example, on the rate controls, the reason. Yes, so these slides have been rearranged. They've been updated. They've been upgraded. So um, slides missing from rate control, not really. I think what, what might have happened is sometimes if I do something and I think you guys are really confused and I'll rearrange them. So this one might even has more, to be honest, in terms of like the rate control and things. 
But yeah, it's just been rearranged to make it easy and also focus on most important parts for you. So the course is always, always, and that's the difference with, with us. And if anyone tells you anything, you can find out for yourself. The difference is all the time we do this, we're constantly improving the course, constantly. Many people don't do that, right? Many people might say, okay, this is the course and that's safe for the year or anything like that. Or may, maybe after two years. With us, it's every couple of months. So those of you on the course now, um, those that were in October, it is different. But when I say different, not totally different, right? So the, the, the base is still the same. But I mean like making it easy, adding stuff, taking stuff, updating things. So it's constantly making it better and better and better and better and easier. Jade says the order is nice. It's fantastic, Jade. Thank you. How many of you found the order better than even in October? So it's just to make it easy for you. Right, size are fantastic. The other size were good, but this took it another level. Yes, Evangeline, thank you for that feedback. Thank you. Those of you on the course, please give me some feedback. It's very good. Jay says it flows better. Marvin says if I had to join, if I joined in October, would I have been able to access this again? Of course, yes. So everyone that joins in October, we um we gave all of them access to this again. We don't normally do that. We don't normally do that, but it's because we really improved the course to that level. So we thought you're all our family members. We all love you guys dearly. So when you hear people saying this stuff about previous shortcuts, ask them how many of you have given the students free access like this again. And everything, we're here to support you, right? So Zoom killed October course. Yes, yeah, Zoom killed October course because we had it. And then in, in December, Zoom started acting up. I think it was because some of my mnemonics like Amy, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so Morbin says, I definitely recommend this to friends. Who else is going to recommend this to friends? Who else? Thank you so much. Many of you are recommending to your friends. And I, what I always say is, um, this is an experience for you, right? When we designed this course, I did not want you to just have a course. How many of you actually have an experience? When you come here, you feel like you feel good. You feel motivated. You feel the energy. You feel like, wow, I'm actually having an experience in this place, right? So this is what this is all about. I'm here for you to have an experience, to enjoy your journey and not just to have a course. Because if I just wanted to give you a course, then I'm just going to give you slides, boring, straightforward, go through it, come back, and that's it. But I want you guys to have experience. And um, we're going to have a massive party. So by next week, we'll start putting that out. It's a free party, but we have limited spaces, right? Because we can't invite everyone. We've got about 700 something. But I want you guys to come and party with us. And so we're going to put this massive, it's going to be in the Holiday Inn. I've already booked the venue. It's going to be in Birmingham in the NEC. It will be off the chain, right? No one can party like previous shortcuts. So because you're all family members, it is going to be free for you, right? We'll think of everything. You're going to have top food, three course meal, the best DJ. You have great entertainment. There'll be entertainers performing on stage. There'll be everything. We're going to have like, like a photo booth. We're going to have so much. You guys are going to love it. You're going to love it. So, but obviously it's going to be limited spaces. We'll probably have about 200 of you that can attend. So we're going to cater for, cater for about 200 of you. So obviously the first to like book would then be in the party. But we're going to um, send all of that out next week. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Marvin, you are, let me see. Let me see. Any questions? Please ask me questions while we're here. The course is done now. So no more um, lecturing. So if anyone needs to leave, that's fine. I'm not going to touch on the course slides, right? So we're not going to do any more teaching. I'm just going to answer the questions that you have here. But um, any more teaching is done for today. We will continue um, on Sunday. Marvin, you're an ideal professor that students need. Thank you, Wadero. Thank you for that. Great to hear that. What time, Marvin? What time? What is the lecture or the party, Zainab? <laughs> the party will be in the evening. It will be from six o'clock. We're going to have an awards event as well. It will be great. If you have a chance to attend, if you can't, that's fine. But oh, it's going to be off this world. Can you bring plus one? No, you can't bring a plus one because we're paying for your meals. So um, everything is paid for you. So um, you can't say, hey, I'm going to bring you. I'm going to bring her. I'm going to be my ex. I'm going to be my future girlfriend. I'm going to be my five wives. No, you can't do that. <laughs> no, nah, it's literally going to be yourself, right? It's going to be yourself, right? Sorry, I know you guys want to bring partners, but hey, it's for you. It's for the family. It's for previous Shortcuts family. It's for you to give you a good time work because we work hard and we play hard so we know how hard you guys work so we want to reward you for that work um is it okay to look at chad vasco again it said if it's two or more you give anticoagulant and if it's male is zero you don't give female is one you don't give so what happens if male score is one sorry a bit confused so chon lin wow i thought that was chon lee I was going to say, wow, Chun Li, that was my best game, like, you know, Street Fighter. Wow, Chun Li, Chun Lin, um, what are you confused about? Because what you've actually said is correct. So 
that everything you said is correct. So um, just, just to clarify that with you. So basically, Chonley, to make life easy for you, anything that is from two and above, it doesn't matter. You don't need to worry whether it's male or female. If the chat bar score is two or above two, you always give anticoagulants. So don't worry about anything. If you see any chat bar score that is anything from two and above, you don't need to ask is it male or is it female, right? You give them anticoagulant, right? Now, if it's less, right? So if a male is one, you give anticoagulants. But for a woman, you don't. Why? Because the natural score for a man is zero and the natural score for female is one. And if you have zero and one, no anticoagulant, then you go one step up. So if you add one to zero, the man becomes one, you give anticoagulants at one. If you add one to one for a lady, she becomes two, from two, you give anticoagulants. So when I say from two, what I'm saying is whether it's a male or female is gonna be two, you give anticoagulants, but for men, once a man is, is one, you give him anticoagulants. So for men, it's really from one, right? From one, from men, you give anticoagulants. Anything that's two, it doesn't matter whether it's male or female, it's going to be anticoagulant. Is that clear, Chun Lin? When you look into it again, you will be fully clear. I need to purchase your meal plans for a weekly basis and how you got your six pack. Yeah, I have a very, very good plan now, right? Because I know a few, shouldn't really be saying that, but I know a few like, footballers <laughs> and so i have like a very good footballers plan it's, it does wonders it's really good it's really really good how do we book for the party so all of this information is going to come out i'm just giving telling guys that in advance but um next week we're finalizing everything right now but next week we should start um getting those of you that want to attend remember we have spaces are limited and we want to make sure that you definitely turn up so if you're going to book a place for the party you have to turn up because we're about 700 of us but um you have we're literally paying for you so if we're going to go that extra mile pay the hotel for you get all of this stuff and then you don't turn up it will be totally heartbreaking because there'll be many other people that would have wanted to get there and did not get a chance so make sure that you definitely turn up if you're going to turn up marvin did you do your nlp course yes i did my nlp course in liverpool i did in liverpool it was an nlp institute it was amazing that's where i studied neuro linguistic programming it's the best is the best one of the best things i ever learned in my life like it's better than anything i studied at uni nlp is great because it's very practical it's very practical i apply it every single day chun lin Chun Lin, if score, yes, Jade. Jade was answering Chun Lin's question. I love when you guys help me out. It's really kind of you to like try to explain as well. Because sometimes I may not explain it as well. So someone might go, oh, I still don't understand, but maybe you guys might bear. And go, oh yeah, Marvin, I know another way to explain it, which is what life is all about. Why if we pay for a OnePlus? Um, no, we're not going to have that, unfortunately. I understand, I understand that people want to come with partners. I understand, but the only thing is when you got to think about it this way, if places are limited for pre-read shortcuts, family members, which is yourselves, if one of you cannot come there because I have somebody else that is not part of the family, that is like maybe someone's wife or someone's cousin or something, then I just think it's just not going to be fair. We wish we could get everybody, right? We wish we could get everyone. Most of the time you have that with events that you pay for, you say, okay, fine, if you pay for the event, but we're not asking you to pay for this. We don't want that to happen, right? You're, you're not paying for the event. We're not inviting you to pay for an event. We are taking care of you. So even though we want to get your partners in there, which would be nice because such things, you want to obviously build a partner. But unfortunately, to get a partner means that I would then have to stop someone from the course attending, which um, it's really for yourself. is for previous shortcuts, family members. Maybe next year, we might make you bigger. Oh, my God, family members. And you've been tied to one, one person. Marvin, which Street Fighter game was your favorite? Um, wow, which one was it? I can't remember now. I can't remember which one. I think it was, I think the first one is like the, the ultimate. Now I used to love playing with Chun-Li, but no, no, like Ken. Wow, Ken was my guy. Ken was my guy. Um, what we got? Oh, thank you, Jade and Marvin. Is it halal food? It, yes, it is halal food. I went there, spoke to them myself. I went there, spoke to them myself. And it's going to be halal food. And the hotel is top notch in Birmingham. They're like, you know what? We can either do all the meat halal or we can have separate halal meat, depending on who you have. They are really good. You will have halal. Everything will be catered for, I promise. What do we wear for the party? The party is going to be top. Wear a nice tuxedo. 
<laughs> lovely dress. It's gonna be it's it's like a ball, right? It's gonna be like proper ball. Like everyone's gonna look at the best. So hey, wear whatever you want, but it's gonna be a proper gala. It's gonna be the proper. Once we start advertising it, some of you are gonna see what it's all about. It's gonna be fun. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. It's literally our first party. It's our first party as a company is the first one. And the plan is to have this every single year to have an annual event. That's why we keep saying to you, those people are not on the course that this is not a course. Because a course is not gonna be doing this for you. <laughs> You're gonna go there, RPS, done, fine, pop, paid, course over, see you, bye. But with us every single year, you have the chance, whether you're a pharmacist, we have a pharmacist group, we will stay together forever. Marvin, drink some water, you must be tired. I'm never tired, I'm a soldier, man, I'm built for this stuff. I'm built for this. Marvin, you coming with your family? My family will be there, definitely. My family will be there. My family has been helping me all these years and it'll be nice for you guys to meet my family. My little crazy ones will be there, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. I feel it works better when we do questions at the end. Yes, definitely. That's what I'm saying. Um, I'll normally do questions at the end, but the reason why I had to do this was because this is a very, very difficult part to understand. Very, very tough. But, um, but it's fine. I so said, we've done quite good slides and then going forward, it will be okay. But yes, we will do more questions at the end so that we can speed through. But that was just because it was very tough. It was very tough because with um, arrhythmia, because they're all linked, it was tough for me to like move to the next thing when people have not understood something because everything was connected there. But great, great, we will have that sorted. What time is the party ending? It's gonna be till midnight. So it's, it's short, but very sweet, right? So it starts from like 6 p.m. all the way to midnight. Short but very sweet. The venue is two minutes away from my wow, most down far. Wow, two minutes away from your house. Fantastic. Your house is gonna be the after party. After the party is Muzdafa's place, the after party. Muzdafa joined this course today and we'll be at the party. That's where we're going for the after party. <laughs> I want a t shirt. You can get t shirts as well. You can get t shirts over there. We're gonna have t shirts. Are you still doing high risk Mondays, by the way? No, I'm not doing high risk Mondays. I'm trying to get the ambassadors to do high risk Mondays. And that's because now I'm doing private sessions on the Mondays. So I've got private sessions with some students and that's on the Mondays, but we will sort something out. I prefer Q at the end too. Yes, I prefer that too. I prefer that too. And as I said to you guys, don't worry about it. This was just a one-off because of this, but going forward, definitely like last time, we will have those at the end. The support on this course is unreal. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. We spend a lot of time. We spend because we love what we do. Like you cannot, like you cannot fake passion. Like I cannot pretend to be interested in you guys. I cannot pretend to love what I do. You either do or you don't. That's why I'm like one of the most real people you're gonna meet. And I think that everything I do, people ask me, how do you stay so many hours? How come you don't drink some water, Marvin? How come? Yeah, I do drink some water. Because everything I do is from passion. I love what I do. I love you guys. I enjoy it. And Uma shares the same like me. So even doing things like the party and all of this is because for us, you guys are amazing. You are our family. We don't look at you and think, all right, you're just a trainee pharmacist. And then once you pass the exam, that's it. We don't see that way. We see you like you are the previous shop because family. We are family. So yes, that's how we see things. That's why we're like this. And the thing about it is that you'll do anything for your family, won't you? You do anything from your, for your family. You're going to go the extra mile. So when we work with you guys, it's the same thing. I'm like, oh, my, doesn't matter. I'm going to be here for 10 hours. It doesn't matter. As long as you guys, it's all good. All right, please. Can you go over the slide of anticoagulation for AF? Um, no, <laughs> just watch it. The reason why I don't want to do that, because it's like, if I go through the slides, then it's a bit unfair because like I've done the course and then I've gone through those slides again and then people are going to go, wow, so you had the second session and I wasn't there. But I would say, Nicoletta, what you want to do is watch the video. And if you have any questions, please ask them. Just post them on Telegram group or ask me, it's fine. But if I go to the slides now, I just it's quite a lot for me to start going through again. So just watch the videos. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. You can't fake vibe, Lucy. You can't fake vibe, no. You cannot fake vibe, right? You cannot fake it. That's what I mean. You cannot fake vibe. How can you fake vibe? You could try doing that for a short time. Some people have a technique to fake vibe for one, but over a period of time, the truth is going to come out. Right? So if I was faking my vibe, then over these years, then I'll be different. Some people say, oh yeah, Marvin was like this, Marvin was like that. I'm not faking my vibe because what you see is what you're going to get. It's going to be like till the end. People that were in the course in October, they're going to tell you I was like this. Those that were there last year, two years, two years, four years ago, this is me, right? So it's like this and I always do extra stuff. Right, let's see, how do I get in contact about private classes? 
Private class is, is a tricky one because it's it was just for people that have already completed the course because it'd be difficult for you to like be learning and then doing the private sessions because private sessions are just questions. So it's not really teaching as such, it's just answering questions and questions and like case studies. So it's more practical stuff. So you have to at least read, have time to read before you can answer, um, get on a private session. Marvin, your skin shows Uma Majid, maybe that's why it's playing up. <laughs> that's a good one, I'm gonna tell him. I don't know why it's got Uma, I gotta tell Uma, change that for me, man. Get my name there, man. come on, come on, I've got a name. What's your morning routine like? Can you tell your specific routine? Like what sort of med meditations do you practice? And the family I want. No, um, not so it's, it's quite straightforward. So um, I got kids, I got four kids, I got four little ones. So in the morning, I wake up to so anyone. I try to wake up a bit early. So I probably wake up about 7, 6.30. 6.30, I do some work. I work for one hour, which is just reading clinical stuff, right? And then I do a bit of meditation. I meditate for just about 10 minutes. That's enough for me in the morning. I then take kids to school, drop them off right? Have a good breakfast, oats, stuff like that. Do a bit of exercise, go to the gym. I go to the gym for like an hour. Then I come back home. I start doing some work. Sometimes I have some training sessions. Sometimes I have like one-to-one -one sessions. Um, I go through all of that and then have the lunch and then back again. I, I love playing basketball. I've got a basketball court next to my house. So sometimes not all the time I could play some basketball. Then pick kids up, come back home again, do a bit of work, do the homework, all the things that you do with the kids. Then do the sessions the evening, finish the session. Then I have to go and see the wife. <laughs> I go to the wife, watch some Netflix, watch some Netflix, and that's my day done. Right? And then repeat. The thing is, if you really want to be healthy, I'll give you a tip. If you really, really want to be healthy and you want to like, then you have to be boring, right? Don't listen to what anyone says. Being healthy means that you're going to eat the same thing over and over again. It's just what it is. My, my like nutrition plan is so simple and it's the same thing over and over again. And I've been doing that for so many years. So don't, of, of course you can have a variety of different nice things, but one of the things that you have to prepare to do to be really consistent and have that good diet, it has to, you have to be boring. <laughs> but it's fun though, boring but fun, but then you treat yourself and everything. But yeah, that's a whole different lecture. I used to be a personal trainer for many years at uni. So that's also my passion as well. Um, let's see, what else have we got? What else have we got? I'm always telling people about oats breakfast. Oats breakfast is crazy. It's so good. And um, you know, overnight, overnight oats is even better. You make the oats, just keep them in the fridge and in the morning. Great, great stuff. So we'll ask you so many questions. You're so interesting. I'll answer your questions. I'll answer your questions. I don't mind. Is there anything like a private class for calculations? There isn't anything for calculations. It's just for clinic at the moment because Uma is so busy, but we are planning to arrange something. We're looking into it. We're looking into it. But um, it depends on Uma's time. I need a nutrition plan, Marvin. That's simple. I can make a nutrition plan easy. Bring this guy on your YouTube channel. Which guy? I can't play that now just in case it's something dodgy. <laughs> All right. Thank you for today. It's been great. See you on Sunday. Thank you all so much. Have a lovely evening. And I look forward to seeing you all. Do you know what I didn't do? I should have stopped the video. But I didn't stop the video. So this is still recording. So this is going to be a very long video. But I should have stopped the recording. And then we could have had a discussion. But that's fine. Take care, everyone. And I look forward to see you all soon. Take care.